place. We got that right. Yeah, Anyways, we are rolling. Good. I'm glad. <laughs> I guess we're here. Um, well, this is the Mink and the Monk. I'm Brad Monkel, and over there, I'm Matt Fink. Thank you for joining us, YouTube, and wherever else you might be streaming this. Um, and welcome to the show, our guest Dean DeMarzo, amazing guitarist and just multi instrumentalist oh. in general, uh, great video editor. Uh, insanely successful YouTube channel, longest solo ever. Um, I am very excited to pick your brain, Matt. Thank is you. that also you your think? Patreon? Is uh, it also longest solo ever? Yeah, I, I try to keep it as consistent as I can. Longest solo ever on Patreon, Instagram, yep. YouTube, TikTok. Oh, right, because I'm on your Instagram, but it's just your, your Dean DeMarzo yeah, Instagram. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, not, I'm really only active on like YouTube and Twitter. Yeah, that might be the only uh, platform that I have a, a higher number than you of subscribers. Possible, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it might be the same exact people, but uh, it's uh, that's it's, good. Yeah, and um, you have a seven-string uh, tattoo on your. I do. Damn. That's right. I forgot oh, about I that. Just noticed that. Yeah, and yeah. two humbuckers. This is yeah. This is my my main guitar is a seven string uh, Tele that I had custom built by Carvin. I'm just letting you know that I was counting the strings as we were getting into this. Yeah, yep. Just let you know I'm on top of it. The tattoo artist was really confused. He's like, "Dude, you know <laughs> guitars usually have six strings, right?" I'm like, "I know, but not this one." <laughs> He thought he caught, he thought you made like a, a really yeah. bad mistake. But yeah. no, I brought in like I, I sent him the file. I laid it all out in <laughs> Illustrator. I was like, put it exactly like this. And uh, I was like, are you sure, man? I'm like, yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's very funny. That's really funny. <laughs> um, cool. All right. Uh, so let's get into it. Uh, yeah. I we were. Uh, let's see. Can I hear? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to figure out how many things you do well. So let me try to list them. <laughs> let me try to list them because it, 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 it seems unfair, but I want to make sure that, so uh, you play drums, yeah. you play bass, mm -hmm. you play piano or, or keyboards in general, synth and the whole array. I get by, yeah. You play guitar. Yep. You sing incredibly well. Oh, thanks. <laughs> you compose. Yeah. Uh, you are, uh, you, you are a recording engineer. Mm -hmm. You do mastering. Yeah. Well, I, I try. <laughs> and you interpret song. Yeah, like covers and arrangements. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Am I leaving anything out? Well, yeah, you cover, remix, um, video, like oh, video art, editing, art free, video editing, yeah, animation, clips, yeah. like like your uh, the pictures, like you do all the the thumbnails, yeah, um, for your YouTube stuff. There, we were watching uh, the video of the. Um, you had all this animation for the the Bendy song. Oh yeah, King bring her Bendy. to me. Yeah, yeah. And did you do all that animation yourself? Because it looks I did. so like authentic to I the style of the game, but it's all yeah. I so many moving parts, original stuff. Like I can't imagine how long it would take to do something like that. That was like three straight days of work. Oh my god. So um, then that leads me to, to my question: Is do you think you're better than me? <laughs> No, no, not in any way. Okay. No, I'm on. really, really good at figuring <laughs> things out at the last second. Like that is my biggest skill set, and yeah, I, it, it always it, has been. Yeah. So you put the challenge in front. And once the challenge is in front of you, you're going yes. to figure it out. Yes. As once the heat is on, I have to get it done. I gave myself a deadline. I announced the song publicly. Like I have a song coming out next weekend that I haven't finished writing, but it's gonna get done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, I'm imagining a dimly lit basement, mm -hmm. a six pack of IPA. Yeah, no, I don't like IPAs. Oh, okay. really dark beer yeah. neither. Oh, really? Yeah, like so Guinness that sort oh, of thing. Yeah. Oh, that's Guinness is my favorite. Yeah. Dark Mother, beer, mother's scotch. milk. You're in your yeah. mother's milk. I yeah, I know that one. No, oh, it's it's brewed right in out. Kingston. Oh, nice. Keegan Ales. Okay. Oh yeah, Keegan. Of course. Keegan makes cool. the mother's milk, and they also make Joe Mama's milk, and they're. Well, they might want to be a sponsor for the show. Sounds funny. But Joe Mama's milk you can't have actually because it has it's brewed with coffee. Oh yeah, no, no, I should avoid that. <laughs> I think it's an eight percent, seven and a half percent, with with coffee and uh, uh, like dark. It sounds really. It's good. a meal. It's fantastic. It sounds. Have you had the good. Guinness with coffee, the nitro cold brew? No. Uh, or terrifying. is terrifying. Is it called Nitro Cold Brew? I don't know. It's Guinness something mixed with coffee. But I don't know if it has caffeine in it. I'll drink it late and I'll be like, I probably shouldn't. But you I said you sound can. good. Yeah, I got to avoid coffee. Coffee in particular really doesn't agree with me. Yeah, we were just talking about that. I'll have a tea now and then, like very rarely. But, but mostly not just, a lot of no, not a lot of caffeine. And I think no. it's processed differently, too. When it's, yeah, I think there's something different. Not that 
this really doesn't matter. But I'm, <laughs> I think it, I think it, it processes a little differently. Yeah. So, so basement, basement, yeah, dark basement, yeah, of a dark beer, yeah. All right, so let's, I, I didn't know where, first of all, I was very excited to talk with you about this because I haven't had a conversation with you and I can't remember. It, it Probably almost 10 years. I mean, we were doing I, the math. I bumped in you at a gig I was doing. You were a guest at a wedding somewhere in the Newburgh area. Uh, this is probably seven years, six. Yes, and you were playing the trio. I was playing in a trio. That's right. And you came from out of nowhere and I, you, it, like, I hadn't seen you in, then that would have been four or five years. Right. Oh, man, that's right. I forgot about and that. And you said hello, and, yeah. and I said hello, and, and I had to go back to work, and you had to yeah. go back to being a guest at a wedding. Was it a wedding? It was. I think it was a wedding. Yeah, it was my friend Brandon's wedding. Probably. Cool. Yeah. Are they still together? As far as I know. Yes. Yes, they're. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> Just enough years go by, and you yes, don't know it's anymore. That's true. That's true. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I have a... So, I I have a lot of questions. Yeah, uh, hit me. But first of all, the YouTube channel is astounding. Thank you, thank you so much. I bumped into you on YouTube when you were doing a stream about how to create. You did an animated thing. I don't even know what it was. Was it you were using a? You were cre you were showing how. So let's just start with that. Are you doing three D animation? Is that what's happening? There's a lot of three D animation, a lot of two D animation, um, which uh, would be like the ink. The bendy tune, yeah. The bendy tune was two D uh, in After Effects, just really trying to emulate like the old rubber hose style uh, of like Mickey Mouse cartoons, pretty much. Okay, and and I don't know. I fessed up. I think yesterday that I don't know what any of these things. That's are. That's okay. Okay, I barely know, and like I'll admit, and I'm open with my viewers that like I I'm. I'm older than my audience, you know, I'm 31. Okay. <laughs> and my and most of my audience is probably in their teens, early teens. So uh, this is more of like an Epstein kind of thing yes. that you're doing? Okay. <laughs> just want to make sure we're on No, it. but I, I try to and keep you up them. on you, the... you bring them in with exactly. the seven string tattoo. Exactly. You're like, hey, I'm kids. cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, but they keep, me, they keep me up to date with what games are popular right now, what, what's going on in their worlds. And uh, they'll be like, hey, you know, I have fans who will... Uh, pretty consistently give me the heads up on something big coming out. And they're like, you should write a song about this. And I'll check the thing out. I'll live stream like two hours of playing the game. And I'll be like, okay, cool, let's write a song. And I'll pull up the Wikipedia page for it and just pick up enough of it to write something, hopefully, that makes sense. And that one, it's funny, that I wrote before the game came out. I just wrote it based on the trailer. I read that in the comments. Like, it came and out the day after the actual game. Yes. So you worked on it. So I worked on it for the, release. Yeah, the song about two weeks and then the animation, like, the four days leading up to it. And I apparently, like, got a lot of things right <laughs> that were, like, revealed in the game. <laughs> really? I just took a lot of, like, wild guesses, total blind shots, and, and got a lot of things right. <laughs> That's absurd. So, really? Yeah, it's good. And what? is anybody giving you from the game? Are they? Did, has anybody reached out to you? No, is it, no, no okay. unfortunately not. There was the one before that. I was really trying to get the uh, the like official game Twitter to like retweet my song because they were retweeting all this other fan art and stuff. And I was like, hey, and I just tag them on Twitter over and over again, but nothing. Really? It looked like it could have been a part of the game. I mean, yeah, like it'll. It, I'll get there. I'm sure. I've only been doing this uh, like original vocal music stuff for maybe six months. Prior, really? Yeah, prior to that, it was all uh, just cranking out like metal instrumental covers of songs from old video games, new video games. I really hit on something with this one game, uh, Friday Night Funkin', which you'll just see all over my channel. Yeah, yep. I don't know what it is, so maybe you wanna well, go. <laughs> I noticed all your highest yeah. ranking videos are like, are in that trend and I hadn't even heard of the game before. Yeah, so this was one of my, again, one of my subscribers, um, shout out to Tercero if you're listening to this. He, he sent me a, a message and was just like, hey, you probably haven't heard of this game, but you should check it out. Uh, they just released a new song from it. It's getting really popular and you could be like the first person to cover this song if you do it right now. And I was like, whatever, I'll check it out. And I listened to it and I hated the song. <laughs> <laughs> It was it was just like nonstop notes. It was it was like Ingve Momstein with a with a speak and spell. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's gonna be eight people in the world that love that, that reference. Get that joke. And three are gonna probably put a hit out yes, on you. Absolutely. <laughs> One of them will be Ingve Momstein. Um, so it, but whatever. Like I, I did it. I did a stream that day where I just streamed five hours and we did the whole thing. We recorded the whole song. I transcribed it, recorded it, arranged it, 
shot the video for it all live on stream and posted it. And it got like 500,000 views that night. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. I guess this is what I'm doing until this train stops. That's um, so you have real time feedback from yeah. your audience. Yeah. yeah. And I, uh, I just barreled down, you know, doubling down on that game's soundtrack. It's a, so it's a rhythm game. It's like Guitar Hero okay. or uh, like Dance Dance Revolution before that. And um, what sets it really apart, it's very character driven. So each song is associated with a character in okay. the game. All right. And it's got an incredibly creative modding community of just people making their own additions to this game. Wow. So you have all these like super enthusiastic kids writing songs, drawing characters for the game, wow. learning to code just so they can put this stuff in the game. And this whole just like pop up industry of, of creative, just hyper creative kids got into it and just started <clears throat> making all these new characters, these new songs. And I just kept playing the songs that were most popular and they just kept growing and growing and growing. And I, I wrote that from like 20,000 subscribers when I started to like 250,000. A little over a year later, you're at 281. I'm at 281 now. Yeah, <laughs> I looked just before you got here just to make sure because yeah. I looked earlier in the week and you were at 270 something. So you're adding them. Yeah, I yeah, still growing, thankfully. Yeah, and and then yeah, about six months ago, the game started to like peter out a little bit, as any you know hype train does. And uh, I, I I felt like I'd hit a ceiling of what I could do in instrumental guitar covers, and it was also starting to feel like just a, an assembly line like I was a vending machine for guitar covers of these songs and you know a song would come out I'd transcribe it I'd record it I was putting no creative effort into this whatsoever and just ship it out the door do the next one it was the most cookie cutter is this where you're thing. doing like the two guitar thing yeah you back have... and forth yes okay so yeah. I saw I didn't realize that's what this that was from yeah and they that and the melodies were just like they were starting to translate less and less to the guitar okay because more notes in the song means it's a harder song to play physically in the game, right? Oh, so it's a rhythm game. They'll have more yeah. and more notes to it's just nonstop gotcha. spam of, of just endless chromatic nonsense. And it sounds cool in the song, but then I go and try to play it on a guitar and it's just physically not possible. Yeah. Uh, and so I was like, all right, I'm, I'm gonna take a risk. I'm gonna get out of this and I'm gonna write some songs. I'm gonna write songs doing what worked for me last time, writing songs about popular things. Mm -hmm. You know, I was covering the most popular songs in the Friday Night Funkin' scene. Uh, so I'll just write songs about the most popular games going on with these people now. And people are making Friday Night Funkin' things about popular games at the moment. So I found the overlap of those two audiences. Wow. And I was like, okay, gonna write a song about that. And I did a bunch of those in a row and those, those did pretty well. Yeah, <laughs> so it's it's good. It's good. Yeah. That's my strategy. But the so the other songs that didn't like so the the two guitar stuff that you were mm -hmm. doing the Fr Friday Night Funkin'. Yeah, some of those you have six seven million hits on. Yes, I didn't realize it was that high. I thought it was still at five. Yeah, yeah. You should look <laughs> at your channel. Check yeah, up check, on check that. your numbers. <laughs> yeah. um, now I really do think you're trying to just say you're in flaw no. that you're better than me. No, I I'm really so feel like, you don't even know how successful it is. No. You know, uh, <laughs> no, I'm I'm just so like single minded, focused on whatever I'm doing at the moment, that everything else just kind of so you know, blinders on. Let me ask you this thing, because uh, I mean, there's so many angles to ask you about. So uh, the fact that they're covers, and Rick Beato talks about this. What ha Rick. so? Was, are, are you friends or fans or I annoyed? What I don't always agree with his opinions. I'll say that's cool. Yeah, he's got. Uh, he's he has a lot of opinions he has out there. Strong feelings on yeah. things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but what I've heard him talk about and get upset about is when he gets demonetized for, or they take the bread that his videos would garner and they give yeah. it to the artist that he's talking about. What it like? What makes this song great? So on your songs where you have seven million views, mm -hmm. those are are those covers? And if so, are you are you reaping the ad money from that, or is yeah. it given back to the game? So it depends on. Uh, the the artist if you're covering something um, from like a major label of mm -hmm. some kind like if I was cover a you know whatever whatever's going on right now post Malone Ariana Grande any of that stuff it would get flagged as a cover specifically and it will actually split the revenue I think like 50 50 with the oh artist, it's 50 50 okay which is nice now what Rick Beato does he just plays their recording 
of when the he song. does the what makes this song great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which I I love that he does that, but that's a different. Uh, set of rights fundamentally that's the mechanical rights to the he song he even got a strike and I, he yeah. did the whole thing what well, I was fascinated by because I never heard anybody else talk about it yeah you know yeah so the the songwriting rights to something and the mechanical rights to the recording are two separate uh, copyrights okay in, in in music law um, and song rights can be licensed without uh, explicit permission okay so I can you know you can record a cover of anything you want and no one can stop you as Fair long enough. as you pay, uh, like some seven cents publishing. per pay, yeah, yeah, yeah. to the, the publisher or the songwriter, you're good. It's the compulsory mechanical license. That's like the one thing I really remember from Sisters Law Sister class. Marianne yeah. Nelson, shout yeah. out to mm-hmm. College yes, of St. Rose. Absolutely. Um, and uh, now- I remember the, other things, but I yeah. can't. we can't go into them. No, no, not on the air. No, yeah. um, Just uh, sorry. <laughs> I was Matt Fink's student for two years, <laughs> 10 years ago, for context. We haven't mentioned that yet. Yeah. It was by default. Yes. <laughs> you, no, that's not true. That's not true. I switched. Oh, really? Because I was taking lessons with Paul Quigley, who sure. I love. He's wonderful as he well. He's wonderful. Yeah. Um, but I felt like I really, really wanted to get into like real deep jazz stuff. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, I remember talking about that stuff with you. Uh, and I made the switch over to you for okay. that. Okay. And I regretted it ever since. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. <laughs> no, actually, I got. I want to tell you this because um, to get off track for just a second, but I want to make sure I tell you this. So I did a record a couple of years ago, not a couple of years ago, probably like eight years ago at this point, uh, over at Scott Petito's sure. place. That's um, where I did the Fat Mink thing. Or we I did know. it up at St. Rose, but then I, I retracked Scott Scott. Yeah, Cool. So I did a record there with uh, Lou Veruzzo. Do you know him? Yes. Drummer? Yeah, yeah. And um, that was such a cool record. Uh, friggin' Joey Eppard sang on a track. Like it was, it was an awesome record. Previous guest, yeah, on the podcast. And um, and at one point, his assistant pulled me aside, uh, and she said, "Did you study with Matt Fink?" And I was like, "Yeah." She's like, "You sound just like him." And that's Get like the the best compliment I've ever gotten in my life. <laughs> I had not mentioned you prior uh, to that, so that was nice. That was uh, nice to hear. That's insane, but and I don't believe it. <laughs> but uh, uh, so that was fun. Um, <laughs> that's very, yeah, I had no idea that that was recorded there, though. Yeah. Do I know this? I don't know this. Is it out? So that was that was an album called Posterity. Okay. Um, which is a really fun record. A lot of funk stuff. We did the chicken. We did a bunch of other cool. like vocal tunes. I did all the horn arrangements on that, which was a lot of fun. Brad's got a funk album out it, oh, nice. about some ailments. It's called Posterity. <laughs> different, it's a different thing. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah, I, I dropped it on WebMD. <laughs> Yeah, was so that, yeah, yeah. that was that was fun. And then a couple years later, I did another record with Lou. Okay, um, called Funk Street, and that one had uh, Barry Eastman on keys. Yeah, why do I know who He's, that is? So big, like jazz producer, big okay. pop producer, did okay. all of Billy Ocean's records. Okay, okay. Uh, oops, I did it again. Britney Spears. That lesser known tune. Yeah. And he was also <laughs> the keyboard player on Big Boss Band. Really? Yes. Wow. Fucking crazy. So he wrote all the tunes on the record. Uh, and do you know who we had on bass? Gary? No. Oh, no, no. The, the, like, the person I would freak the fuck out about more than anyone else if we oh, had on bass. I, tell me who it is. So Will I, Lee. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to hang out with Will for like a week. Did you post stuff. about How do I not know this? I, it was like right before COVID. And then it didn't come out until like after a couple years of COVID. So you mean last year? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it came out like last year. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't doing a ton of, plus it doesn't like, it's a weird, it's slightly out of alignment with my usual brand. Okay. You know, like I'm, yeah. I'm doing all these metal covers of Friday Night Funkin' songs and writing songs about video games. And also I'm on this smooth jazz record you should check out. <laughs> That's awesome, man. But it was fun. It was, it was, it was such an amazing week. So where can we find the, those records? Uh, so those albums are Posterity and Funk Street both by Lou Veruzzo, and they're both really, really awesome. Cool. Awesome. Out on all streaming kind of things. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so, what was I talking about? Uh, what were you talking about? Writing uh, songs. Covers, we were. <laughs> oh, covers and the legality of that. So Yeah, the legality of it, right. With, um, on YouTube, technically, that compulsory mechanical license does not apply to video. You need a sync license, which you do need to directly talk to someone about and like work that out. Except YouTube has negotiated stuff with like every major publisher. So they'll just handle it for you. If I cover an Ariana Grande song or something, it'll get claimed as a cover and I'll split it 50-50 with people. Oh, okay. If it 
uh, there's some people who aren't cool about it, like Guns N' Roses will just strike your video from the face of the earth. Is you it really all of GNR or is it one guy? It's it's one guy. It's, it's yeah, it's, it's yeah. Well, that's all that's left of it, yeah. them, isn't it? I know that's one of your heroes, Brad, just because you share some some biological traits. I should genetic traits. You're both injury. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I get it. So he doesn't want to talk, but I know that Axel is known as being kind of hard to deal yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. He's he's a character. Did you do a GNR cover, and that's how you found this? I out? was I was in an '80s hair metal tribute band for of a while. You were. And um, I, I have had like 18 different careers since I graduated college. It's amazing. I, I, it's I owned incredible. a yoga studio for a little bit. What? Yeah. Sorry, we have to end this. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> a yoga studio? I, I opened a yoga studio. My wife opened a yoga studio, but I, I helped to finance it. Um, and uh, we opened it in uh, December of 2019. Oh, which was not a good not time, a great time to, to open, open any kind of in-person business, let alone a yoga studio. <laughs> so that closed. Um, oh, it was short lived. Really? That's it's, yeah. it, I didn't realize she's a like is she is she an instructor kind of. Yeah, thing? she yeah. was a yoga teacher wow. full time for a while. Wow. Um, yeah, I only I met her at St. Rose, I believe. Yeah, right? yeah, we met in my sophomore year. Yeah, at St. Rose. So that's right about the time I met her, but I didn't know anything about her. Really. Yeah, she she was in the communications program. Okay, there studied film and everything, but it wasn't uh, it wasn't the most comprehensive, you know. <laughs> curriculum yeah, i got you all right is it so, still there as far as i know i don't know i actually don't know okay, if right. anything survived the uh the, the, the there purge. were some cuts the purge yes the purge <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was it was a bit of a bloodbath yeah, yeah sure uh so that is so is she still doing yoga or you're just not at there or not no, no okay. not a ton no she works in insurance now okay so. cool cool all right basically the same thing <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I've done a ton of different things. I was in an '80s hair metal band. Oh yeah, did and you wear a wig? Yeah. Oh. Oh, you want you want a picture? Yes. Okay. In fact, that's going to be on the cover yeah. of this particular <laughs> podcast <laughs> because I never known you to not have hair like this. And congratulations yeah. on keeping your hair as you've. Oh, gotten. it's it's not going to be long. <laughs> it's it's headed back. I think it looks great. When you were naming the stuff he does before, I was I was thinking he's got a nice beard line and hair. His hair looks yeah. great. <laughs> the beard will probably stick around, yeah. but I don't I don't have high hopes for the hair. <laughs> oh, why? Well, it comes from your mom's side. Yeah, mom's my dad, maternal grandfather does not have a lot going on up here. So, well, uh, I don't have any pictures of my maternal grandfather with any hair whatsoever. So, um that's that's what my hopes and dreams died a long time ago. All right, you ready? I am ready. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, you look like Jason Becker. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. How did you get to look so angry? Did you just think of some of your professors previously? I didn't get along with the drummer. So. <laughs> you even have the, the cool, you cool. still have that red Ibanez. Yeah, I, that, I bought that red Ibanez for the gig. Wow. Maybe we can hold that up. Oh, oh, we can, you, just, you can just pull it up oh, yeah, on well, screen. Yeah. That's awesome, though. Thank goodness you didn't have to grow it because that's like three years of growth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no. I just picked up a quick wig. But uh, <laughs> thousands of dollars in hair care products. Yes. <laughs> All you young guitarists thinking about what you have to buy. To, uh, don't forget about the pedals. Don't forget about the wig. You got to get, get yourself get a, a good wig. wig. I'm endorsed by Fender and Pert. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, Oh, but yeah, I recorded like one of our rehearsals and just posted it on a private YouTube yep. video just to like send to the band to like listen back to it, you know, and and it got struck down. It was a private video. And it got struck. Wow. Yes. So like an algorithm picks it up? Or, yes. uh, okay. So it's not just humans. No, definitely. Because it was a private video. No one could have even seen it. Something in there detected that we played Sweet Child of Mine and uh, and took it down. It was wild. So that's insane. Yeah. Anyway, that's that's covers. But in uh, I was gonna say in video games. Yeah. Like none of that infrastructure for detecting that stuff is really there. So unfortunately, and I feel bad about this. None of my YouTube videos are claimed as covers, really. Uh, so you're smart on a lot of levels. Well, I do. I do license them properly for like Spotify and everything. Uh -huh. I make sure it goes to the, the publisher and the songwriter. But on YouTube, like it just doesn't. If it doesn't get claimed, there's no way for me to even say like, "Hey, claim this." But wow, eh, I don't know. That's and with is. all of the copyright things that are happening, it's amazing that that's a niche thing that yeah. like doesn't get picked up on. It's wild. Yeah, 
Very cool. Mm -hmm. So this goes, so let's talk about that. In 2019, what was the something hill record? What was it called? Oh, Green Hill Funk. Green Hill Funk. That was fun. So that, that actually led to a really cool thing. That's like one of the, the high points of my, my career. I think. Uh, then I want to hear it. Let's yeah. hear it. So that was, um, I was really into Wolfpack at the time. Uh, you know, free, uh, Fearless Flyers, that whole mm -hmm. like really funky, stripped down, uh, wrecking crew, muscle shoals kind of sound. Yep. And, and I spent like a month really dialing in that tone. Um, you know, I, I loosened the head of my snare drum so it was practically falling off and then duct tape a towel to it. You know, everything I could to get just like the jankiest just <laughs> sound you could, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and I was reading, um, I was reading, uh, God, I can't remember his name. The, uh, what's the? Postmodern Jukebox, that yeah, band? Yeah. Yep, yep. I was reading his, the guy who, who founded that, Scott something, I wanna say. I was reading his autobiography, um, and I was, this is like the cheesiest, stupidest jazz story ever. I was, like, I was on the train back from New York City, reading <laughs> the autobiography of this jazz dude, and, and these arrangements just literally started coming to me. Uh, and so I was just like mumbling voice memos into my phone, trying not to lose them. On uh, Metro North? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, I don't know that that creativity just kind of happens when you're, you know, you're in the shower, you're about to fall asleep anywhere. You can't be near an instrument. <laughs> yeah. It's going to come to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm sitting there with my wife on the train, just like mumbling Sonic the Hedgehog songs into into my uh, phone. But yeah, I did this this record called Green Hill Funk, which was a uh, like a Motown style. It was pretty much just ripping Wolfpack style of Sonic the Hedgehog tunes that I grew up with. Uh, yeah. And, and I had fun with it. I put them out over the course of like a couple months on YouTube and I released the record and it did fine, you know, it did okay. And then about a year later, um, we were moving actually. It was like the day we were moving. So we had nothing out or anything. My computers were all in, in boxes. And I get this email from John Sano, who's the composer of Sonic the Hedgehog, all the games. Uh, and he's like, hey, I loved your arrangement of Escape from the City from your Green Hill Funk record. I want to play I think that's like track it. three or four in there. I think four, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yep. And uh, can you, s I want to play it, that arrangement on tour this year. Can you send me the MIDI files for it? And I was like, uh, yeah, shit, I don't have internet right now. You know, we haven't gotten that cable hooked up yet. Right, right, right. I gotta like run to Panera with my laptop and, <laughs> and hook up my computer for two seconds so I can get the files off the hard drive. And like, I just scrambled to get that back to him. Uh, well, that's amazing. And then, and then a year later, he's like, hey, if it's okay with you, um, we're recording this like tribute album for Sonic's 30th anniversary. And I wanna record that arrangement on it and credit you is that okay and i'm like of course obviously <laughs> wow so there's a there's a sega branded record out there of, of sonic remixes uh that has the composer of the song playing my arrangement of his song and how did you no wonder crazy. you can quit coffee you have like really exciting things that it's, keep it's you so much fun buzzing you yeah. don't need any caffeine whatsoever yeah that's was, amazing how cool is that it was it was super super cool and, and was sonic like a like, like big part of your yeah, life i mean when you were younger like, it's, like as a series it's probably the thing that the first thing i got into music wise because i was playing those games at like two years old wow and the soundtracks are just incredible it's all it was all like new jack swing era stuff okay. of that time really funky amazing bass lines um the sega genesis the sound chip in it was literally a dx7 like a Yamaha DX7. I didn't synth. know that. So the sounds in it are incredible. It's like this awesome FM, FM synthesis in there. Um, and I still use patches from the Sega loaded into my DX7 uh, plugin. Okay. Because they're, they're compatible. You can literally rip them out of the game and drop them in a DX7. I watched you talk about, you use, I, I know yeah, you do this because I, I, I watch them all the time. Yeah, yeah, I watch you in a stream. Yeah. <laughs> What's funny about your streams is when people tell you, when they don't correct you, but 
they're like they they start to nerd out a little bit and they don't realize that you actually know exactly what it is that you're talking about and <laughs> so then they're I like i don't know it. if this happens in every stream but i was watching one. i was laughing you're like oh, nah no. you say the name and it's some goofy name because it's somebody's whatever their yeah. handle is and they're like nah i don't i don't I'm, I'm not seeing that or no i don't think that's right you know and like you <laughs> and it's hilarious because it's like that's inner that's like totally the in the world that you embrace yes as, as in the internet where all bets are off and you have to have you on one level you're having a conversation about how you're layering three different bass sounds to yes. give you this thing and then some 12 year old questioning <laughs> questioning whether or not you did it correctly yes. or whatever remain true to something but i watched you talk about the synth sounds and it's wild it's pretty wild it's, it's fun those streams are so that is the thing I think more than anything else that keeps me like having consistent output because I know I wouldn't get nearly as much done if people weren't watching me do it. And like, like when I sit down every Tuesday night to write something, it's, it's a habit. It's built into my weekly schedule. Every Tuesday night I stream. I didn't realize it was every Tuesday. Yeah. And this is on Patreon or is this you? It's you, just right on YouTube. Okay. Um, so I live stream every Tuesday night on YouTube and usually Wednesday mornings I'll, I'll do like just some play some video games on stream or something. But uh, every Tuesday night, I stream three hours of music production, no matter what. And I just whatever you're have doing. to get something Whatever's done. on your menu. Yeah, whatever's, yeah whatever, whatever's coming up like in two weeks that I'm gonna post. Wow. Were you like a procrastinator before? Is oh like, God, is, yes. Is that, like you were saying, you need a, like a deadline to work yeah. towards, and I, I relate to that, but it's like, you get a lot done, so it's, I, yeah. and, and it's only because people are watching me do it. If I if I wasn't, I'd just screw around on TikTok for like an hour and just scroll that. But you can't do that. That happens. A hundred yeah. people are watching you, and you have to keep them entertained. So you have to keep moving. That's why I thought it was your Patreon because it looks like on some parts of your screen it says uh, whatever you call patrons. Right? Oh, I, members. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I, so that's why I thought that. Yeah. Was. So that's YouTube's version of Patreon memberships. Oh. Um, and that's just there as like a little uh, like reminder to like, hey, you could you could do that. You could join that and give me money if you wanted. Yeah, yeah, I didn't. I didn't give you any money. I'm just no, saying okay. that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I uh, noticed that I was fascinated that you can interact. And then I, the reason why I was, I got, because I subscribed to your page. So I got the notice that the, you were mm -hmm. streaming. So I was like, and I was in the hot tub, I'm not going to lie. So, <laughs> uh, and if I'm being honest, it's not the first time I've thought about you when I'm hey, in, in the whatever, hot tub. Whatever you got to do. <laughs> yeah. That's longest a, hot tub ever. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> that's a, that's a, part two, we'll, we'll yeah. come back yeah. to it. Uh, but I was watching it and you had like, I don't know, like 500, look like 500 views within the first hour. Yeah. I, I watched about 45 minutes to an hour of it. That's why wow. I was like, I was laughing. at. There was a couple times someone called, not called you out, but there was a storyline plot hole i guess is what you would call oh it. yeah 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 and, and 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 this you wrote this song it's a great song and you're it it it, 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 it like some nerd found out that like yes. your story didn't make sense on some level and and like uh, you just started laughing and you're like uh, there's plot holes in my song yeah. there, there song. was like a line in the verse that directly contradicts a line in the chorus i'm like who cares it sounds good <laughs> it, and, and i don't know it i don't know the backstory so I'm listening and I was like, it does sound great. But I didn't know that there was something that didn't line up. It wasn't the... even in the backstory. It was just literally like the words didn't make sense together. <laughs> just on a pure English language level. Yeah. But I don't care. Well, There's so many songs where you like actually sit down and look at the lyrics. And you're like, what the hell is this even? I mean, great writers just make up words yes. that rhyme and don't make any. Oh, I mean, yeah. yeah. So, so much. A yes record or something. Oh, like. my God. Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. Stevie Wonder does yeah. that. Yeah. No. It's, it's all. It's going to be OK. Cuckoo but I was going to when we were listening, like, and, and the listening I've, <laughs> I've been doing this, to your covers, like, you do write great lyrics Thank you. in the style. Like, like all, everything just sounds like it should be in that place. But I'm sure if you're a nerd who likes to break down lyrics yeah. on YouTube. It's, I am so, I am the worst about lyrics as far as songs go. I don't learn lyrics to songs unless I absolutely have to. I'm, I, I, I get that. Well, because we're instrumentalists. We think about the instrumental stuff. The lyrics are level. the last part of yeah. it for me. I'll too. think about the vocal melody as yep. an instrument, and that's cool. You think about the sound of the snare drum yeah. and the pocket, oh, yeah. the low end and yeah. all. That's what pulls you in, and then eventually you listen to the actual lyrics. <laughs> yeah, at last. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And they've, they, I've, I've, I've actually heard that's why instrumental music like jazz has remained so popular outside the U.S., because in places like Japan or Brazil, there's still a really solid jazz scene. 
because to them, most popular music is instrumental. Oh. If they don't know what's being sung, it may as well be instrumental. And so that's why on that oh. level, something like a guitar melody isn't too different from someone singing in English. That's fascinating. So they I can appreciate it both that. on the same level. Uh, and I think as instrumentalists, we're all thinking the same way as that. So when I'm writing lyrics, I start with like a melody yep. and then I make sounds. I'll just like be woo ba woo woo, you know, yeah. and, and then I'll find words close to those sounds. I watched you do sense. it. You pull up a thesaurus. Uh, yeah, I'm you're usually sitting there with a thesaurus and a rhyming dictionary. Yeah, it's fascinating. I've never, that's what's amazing about what you do. You are a warts and no, nothing, it's warty, <laughs> but you're like, you will, you will take risks in yeah. front of your audience and, and learn from it and create what, that's fast. Yeah. I don't know a lot of artists that are doing that. And that's sort of a thing like, I've never seen that done before. I try really hard to communicate that to my, uh, you know, my viewers on there. I also I have a Discord community of like three thousand people, okay. from who are fans of the channel who just come in there to talk about music production and games and stuff. And I see questions in there of like, how do I write better songs? I'm like, write a lot of really bad ones. Don't be afraid to write absolute garbage. I, I loved your advice in there. It's like your people are always saying, what can I, yeah. and you're like, you gotta just do it. Whatever it is yeah. that you, in it's, your own words, you're like, whatever it is that you're, you were talking about covers of tunes mm -hmm. and doing them in a style, pick the style you know, yep. and just keep doing it. Yeah. That's like the advice that nobody thinks is actual advice. Right, It's the it sucks to hear. It, it's the same thing as like, you, you know, embrace the suck. Oh yeah, that's yeah. what that's the whole Absolutely. point. Yeah. I, I think of creativity as like like a pipe coming out of my head, and sometimes that pipe's clogged up with shit, and there's only <laughs> one way it's gonna come out, you know. And then the good stuff's in there somewhere. In there somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a muscle you have to keep yeah. exercising it. And uh, I, I was told that in college from I used to study with uh, this pianist David Berkman, and mm -hmm. he used to say. Uh, write a tune every day most of them are going to suck but you yeah. got to exercise that muscle exactly. but you're exercise most people are like when i'm practicing i don't want a camera on and you're yeah. just like yeah let's, let's 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 mess it up let's see what happens yes. and then at the end something great comes out so you're like showing the whole philosophy of yeah. this is how you get it done which I try but that's how you have a community how did you know that that would be a community i didn't you didn't i didn't no i had no idea um I've been I've been doing those live streams like somewhat weekly for years. Wow. And uh I don't know, I just started I just started doing it and it sucked less and less as time went on. <laughs> Cuz when you start out live streaming, you're you're thinking about every word you're saying, you're trying to think about being entertaining on stream, but after a while it just uh it's just it's a muscle like anything else like you said. Yeah. Yeah, but it look how fruitful it's been. Like to, it's been good. It's what been an good. amazing! Uh, I would never have thought you created something that simultaneously developed an audience at the same time that you were just trying to do something. Yeah. And lo and behold, it's, you can make a living from it's it. It's amazing. I'm super thankful. I've been full time for a year now, as of this November, and uh, it's been awesome. Cool. Yeah. So full time means that you are earning a living from what you are doing on all these different platforms. Yeah, I, I quit my job in uh, November 1st, 2021. I was working at a music store for the last like 10 years. I was teaching guitar yep, and uh, guitar, bass, drums, piano, music production, all that. I had like uh, I mean, <laughs> hundreds of private students over the years. I was teaching 65 kids a week by the end of it. Oh my God. And, and I really, I was overwhelmed because I was working nine to five and then teaching to like nine or 10 at night most nights. Wow. And that's a lot. That's a lot. And I was gigging it. on the weekends too. So it was just, it was not, not maintainable in any way. And then just as I was starting to feel really overwhelmed and wanting to get out of it, COVID hit. And I kind of took the opportunity to just cut it off with almost all my students. So you weren't doing any online teaching? I tried at the beginning of it. I still like 10 students stuck around. And that just kind of dwindled down as we, we both realized online teaching is just. It was the worst. It's, it's re for like with beginners and with kids, it is almost impossible. Yeah. Um, like I take online lessons. I take voice lessons and mixing lessons once a month. Do you really? Yeah. Well, wow. yeah. I, um, cause I, cause my voice, I'm like, I've been getting by with singing for like 15 years now. And I, I really wanted to take it to the next level. So I, I like bought this online course on singing and it helped, it was good. Okay. And then the guy who sold the course sent out an email, hey, uh, 
this guy who is one of my favorite metal singers of all time is taking private students are you interested and i was like yes absolutely wow so uh, so now i'm taking lessons with lucas magyar who's the singer of uh this band vale amaya who's like an amazing prog metal band okay uh, and i just take lessons with him once a month it's been a couple years of that now one-on-one -on -one. yeah okay. just one-on-one -on -one skype lessons uh, I just I just literally go stand in my closet with my phone and he he just walks me through the stuff I'm doing that week. 90% of the time, it's just you need to practice more, <laughs> which yeah. is always. The, and that's that was what most of our lessons were, too. It was like an hour long hang session. It was like therapy for me most of the week. Really, I don't. And, yeah, I don't remember. exactly. I remember you playing the piss out of everything you no. went home with. Come on. You came in with Rob. Like I said, you should check this Robin Ford solo out. It's fantastic. It's on a tune called Rugged Road. That was a good, good solo. Yeah. Yeah. It came in the, at your jury and played the <laughs> solo perfectly. Like that was what you, you know, and, and not only per you played it with, with feel. Thank you. You know, Ro like the, you, Robin Ford is one of the most elusive guitarist as far as phrasing is. Nobody sounds like him, but you, you did for your, <laughs> Thank so you. don't, don't, I, I wouldn't. Um, yeah. 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 It's yeah. I mean, uh, and like that, like Robin and Oz Noy, like the two of your introduction to me of the two of those okay. guys, like a hundred percent changed my whole guitar really trajectory. Absolutely, because yeah. before that, I was into like, like as far as funk stuff goes, like Chili Peppers. Mm -hmm. That's about as far as it went. Mm -hmm. But I didn't understand what you could do on the guitar. <laughs> those two will remind God. you of what's what's possible yeah. and more or less what's impossible. Yeah. Cuz yeah. <laughs> they, they, yeah, I don't, don't do it. You don't mistake either one of them for anybody no. else on the planet. No. It's amazing. Yeah. So, um where were we before that? You love Axel Rose? Uh Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, where were we before? Oh, the uh, the, the your uh, the way the whole YouTube oh, the whole the, lessons the, online lessons and online, then, right, right. Yeah, so I, I, I was able to quit my full-time job um, and, and just go just into writing and recording music. And now I'm, I'm taking this next step, which is launching my own online courses. Yeah, for music I production. saw your announcement for that. Oh, thanks. Yes. So what, what platform is that on? Yeah, so that's going to be its own website, quickstartmusic.com. Um, that's a, a domain I bought like five years ago when I thought of it. I was like, that's that's going to go. And that's a good name. That's easy to remember. So I this is your own that. platform? Yeah. Yeah. So it's a whole new company. Um, it's uh, it's going to be online video courses. It's uh, I, I really so there's there's not a lot of great music production courses out there. And the ones that do exist out there are like three or four hundred bucks each. And when most of my audience are like middle school and high school age kids, that's out of reach for them. Yeah. But like something along the lines of the cost of private lessons is within reach. Yep. So I'm doing a comprehensive collection of courses, everything from music theory to music production, audio engineering, how to point a mic at something. I want to get into like instrumental lessons too. Okay. And uh, just literally cover everything you could need to know as a musician for 60 bucks a month and just have access to everything. Well, yeah. I don't think anyone's offering that. There's like Fender Play is the closest yeah, thing. I've heard of that, but I don't know. I haven't checked it out. And it's cool. They launched uh, like right at the beginning of COVID, um, which was a good time to launch that kind of thing. And that's like 20 bucks a month, I think. And there's good guitar lessons on there. It's fine, but it's not like everything. And I feel like as a musician right now, you have to know everything. Mm. You have to know how to set up a microphone. You have to know how to set up a video camera and and get yourself set up on YouTube to market yourself. You can't just walk into a club and get a gig anymore. Well, there's no gigs. There's no gigs. <laughs> That's the problem. I mean, I don't even mean that to sound cynical. No. I just mean there's not enough money yeah. to support whatever it is. Like when we were when I was coming up there wasn't enough money right. for that. And so now there really isn't. You've got to be you've always had to be a, a like a a business person yeah. as a musician, but now you've got to be a business person and a, a creative director of 10 different kinds of media, you know, short form on TikTok, long form on YouTube. Uh, you got to be a graphic designer so your album covers don't suck. You, like it's all, or you hire stuff out. You hire for that. out, yeah. But when you're starting out, you don't have the money to do that. Yep. You got to, you got to understand marketing and like understand what people actually want to spend the time to seek out and listen for. When you also know what 
what to spend time on and what you talk I've heard you talk about this and I think it's your philosophy of it you just got to do the thing yes. instead of worrying about oh I need a logo I need I need a I need that you spend a year on on typeset for right the, right, right. instead of getting Man. to what it is you're trying to put out there and right. you just keep not only are you putting it out there you're showing the entire process yeah, I, I love showing the process. I love that that educational. Don't turn side me of it. down in your monitor. Is that what you just did? You <laughs> yeah, keep me dude. where it was. If My you have tinnitus after tired, this, man. you deal with it. It's important. Anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. The, uh, <laughs> I'm I'm a big believer in the eighty twenty principle. Yep. Which is that eighty percent of your results come from twenty percent of your efforts, uh, and also eighty percent of your pain comes from twenty percent of your process too, or or things in your life or something. So for example, during the first like 15 years of my YouTube channel, when I was just kind of sitting steady, mm -hmm. uh, not, not making a ton of progress, I would be killing myself spending literally like 40 hours a week on a song, tweaking the mix for like 30 of those hours. Shoot the video over and over again because I wanted to shoot everything live. I didn't want to lip sync everything. I wanted live drums on everything and live drums are a nightmare to edit, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, they are. I, I was just doing everything I could the hardest way I possibly could. Uh, these like intricate split screen edits. Yeah, you're recording an entire album yeah, every day. Every day. Yeah. Yeah. And and it wasn't getting anywhere. And then um, the show WandaVision came out. Oh yeah, yeah. And there was this there was this awesome tune in like the seventh episode or something. Uh, it was it was like the big villain reveal song, okay. and they wrote like an awesome classic like villain song in like the style of the monsters theme like it was that kind of thing okay really fun and uh and my wife was like you got to cover this right now you need to get on this because she she's always like way more in tune with stuff than i am okay i'll be like working on some obscure game boy game from 1996 or something she's <laughs> like no one cares about that <laughs> people she's wrong i've seen your nerd audience yes yes, yes. they do but 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 when something's really big and you can capture it in the moment, you, yeah. you can't beat that. That's true. Yep. And so the next morning, I got up at like 5 a.m. I banged out the whole arrangement in an hour and recorded it. Shot a video as quickly as I possibly could. Lip synced everything. No live drums. Uh, just vocal, one guitar angle for the video, and uh, and edited together as quickly as I could threw it up on YouTube that morning and that that blew up. That was like 100K in a couple days. Wow. And And the songwriter, uh, so that song was written by uh, Kristen Anderson Lopez and Robert Lopez who wrote a little tune called Let It Go, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and also like everything else Disney's done in the last few years, they're like Disney's- They might've spent people. more time on their production than you did on- Probably, <laughs> probably. And uh, she tweeted it out. She tweeted out my cover of it. Really? Which was wild. Um, and then I actually got to meet her at Comic-Con. We went to a, uh, they did a panel on like Broadway people writing for TV shows. Mm. And she was there and, um, and a few other composers were there. And she and her husband uh, had heard I would be there through a mutual friend. And, and they like shouted me out during the panel and everything. It was crazy. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, it was fun. So your wife... She called it. She, she called knows. That one. She knows her stuff. She's way more, way more intuitive about everything than I am. That's fantastic. So anytime she tells me to do something with the channel, I, I do it. But how about the dishes? You doing the dishes and keeping the house clean? I do. Okay. I do all the cooking in our house, actually. Really? Yeah. Um, cool. And he's a good cook. Damn it! it. God damn. Let's not go that far. I just <laughs> do the cooking. <laughs> That's wild. That, that it's amazing. Uh, like again, I uh, I mean, I don't know where. Did you have a like a specific thing you wanted to? You're fine. But all of these things that you're doing, what kind of floored me, and you mentioned it a little earlier about what you're doing with the drums and tweaking the snare and lowering it till it was janky and trying yeah. to find out. Like, that's not a normal, everyday thing that guitar, I think of you as a guitarist. I, it's funny, I don't think of myself as a guitarist anymore. I, no, no, I think of you now as a musician who happens to play guitar and everything else that you do. But when I, I got, so you had the video out of, a, I'm sorry, the Something Hill, Green Hill Funk, yeah. Green Hill Funk. So, and I'm watching the video of it, and I see that you have a towel over the snare, mm -hmm. the way that you're attacking the bass string. You have insights into these instruments that most singular like people have. So, what I want to, what I was thinking about as I'm listening to it, because first of all, that record feels 
as good as it sounds. Thank you. So there's pocket there. There's and you've always had great feel, but to get it across as you're playing every instrument, it's kind of annoying. <laughs> um, no, it's amazing. So what I want to know is, I know you're going to answer. So let me just ask this long sort of yeah. uh, Jason Bateman style 300 point question, uh, which is uh, uh, shout out to Smartless. I was going to say, I do listen to Smartless. I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I knew when you laughed that I was like, oh, you listen to Smartless. Yes. Okay. So. Did you study each one of these instruments as you were coming up, or are you? You strike me as the person that can look at it and just know how to do it. I, I think there's certain fundamental things that translate to every instrument. Yeah, there's groove, there's um, like intensity, and like how hard you're hitting the thing, mm -hmm. and that is the same on every instrument. You'll do the same thing no matter what you're, I mean, like, I don't know any wind instruments. I can kind of mess around on flute, but that's it. So that's not you playing saxophone on that album? No, no, that's one of my best friends from childhood, uh, Rich Rose, okay. he's an amazing sax player. Um, uh, so no, I, I think, um, I think there's certain things that translate across every instrument. And that's just kind of, it, it's like, it's like learning romance languages. Like they all have pretty much the same stuff going on under the hood. Uh -huh. uh, it's just like, okay, for guitar, you know, you're holding it this way. For bass, you know, you got to relearn the right hand situation. Mm -hmm. That's it. And for drums, um, I, I approach the guitar like a drummer more than anything else. That was my first instrument was drums. Same. And yep. um, it's, it's something that like anytime I'm playing an acoustic guitar thing. So my wife and I play acoustic like gigs on the weekends at like wineries and stuff. Okay. She sings. She's wonderful. Um, and, and, and not I, for nothing, you said right hand situation. That was the name of Brad's girlfriend in eighth grade. <laughs> I did. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. So it's, but but like the the concepts of articulation, staccato yep. and legato and everything, it all translates one to one across every instrument. Mm -hmm. So as long as you master that stuff, you're good anywhere. You're good on any instrument. Yeah, but you're very nonchalantly saying, yeah, as long as you learn French, Spanish, <laughs> Italian, you're fine. I, but, but you speak all of them really well. Is my again, point. Again, it comes down to that eighty twenty principle of like, what's the what's the parts I need to know to make this sound really cool. Like my alternate picking on bass sucks. I can't. I can't play like really clean lines. Okay. Uh, you know do, 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 that kind of thing. Not at all. So no Jocko. No Jocko. Okay. No, I mean uh, it's and if I if I do get any of that down, it's because I played that one line a lot. Oh yeah. You know yeah. Uh, but um, so I'll, I'll do a lot of legato stuff on bass. I, I'm good with the slap and the pop because again, I'm just thinking of that like a drummer. The drummer. Yep. Yep. Uh, the bass, this is the bass drum, this is the snare drum, you yeah. know, that's yep. it. And, and same for guitar. When I'm playing those acoustic gigs with my wife, I'm thinking the drum beat mm -hmm. and playing that on the guitar. Uh, and I'll, I'll like hit the guitar in between beats, do all that Andy McKee yeah, kind of stuff. Yep. And um, it all just translates and I get the 20% of it down to come across and make you think I know what I'm doing. <laughs> it's, it, but you're making music. And that's the, I think that's your, probably your, your primary focus is, and that yeah. all comes under the umbrella of funk groove, rather groove yeah. and pocket and those types of things. Yeah. I think of myself as a producer and arranger first, mm -hmm. and then these instruments are just kind of like means to an end to yeah. get there. And I use, like, I will totally use sampled instruments when I have to, or when I can get away. Like all my drums are all programmed. Now? Now, yeah, absolutely. Okay. It's all programmed drums because I can program better than I can play. Yeah, but you can play the drums. I, I can play, but like if I play it, I either have to record live drums and then, you know, my live drum editing workflow is a freaking nightmare because <laughs> I record like 19 mics and then, you <laughs> yeah. know, perfectly editing everything so it's on the beat. And if I record like electronic drums, like I have an awesome electric kit, Alesis makes such cool stuff now. Mm -hmm. And if I play that in, I've still got to go in and clean up the MIDI that comes from that. You know, sometimes there's double hits that double, I got to yeah, clean up and the it sucks. Stuff, or yeah. I can just program it and it's done. Okay. And I can get exactly what I want right away. Yeah, but you're but you're editing you're you're you're, you're doing the uh, the sounds. You're you're choosing what you want. So like yeah. on the metal version of I can't remember. You have five tunes at the top of your page. Mm -hmm. Five or six. Yeah. Six? Five. One is a metal version of 
Friday Night Funkin'. Is that what it the, is? The popular tune? The is? snare drum is ridiculous. And the double bass, I mean, I don't know how much Lars Ulrich is in yeah. your life, but you're capturing the kind of the, that, not muted, but I don't know how you describe it. Yeah. It's almost an electronic sound, but he, yeah. a, 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 on an acoustic instrument. But your attention to aesthetics is insane. Thank you. Because I, where you're, the sound and where you're placing it in the mix shows me more about your engineering skills and your aesthetics when it comes to drumming Thank and you. your overall production. Again, I'm not very fond of you <laughs> because that's not, that's, I, it's, you're in command of all of it in such a deep level. Thank you. I, I, I really, um, I try to pull a little bit from every, like every genre that I've been into over the years has taught me something. Mm -hmm. Like I was into a lot of electronic music in, in college. Um, so a lot of that dubstep stuff, mm -hmm. the really heavy, punchy electronic drums, that comes through in the way I write my like live drum sound now. Okay. Um, of course, all the like jazz stuff I did in college comes through in in my solo playing. Like anytime I'm writing a solo, it's coming like it's in a metal world. So you'd think it would come from like uh, I'm trying to think of freaking metal, like a Kirk Hammett kind of place. Mm -hmm. But no, it's really much more like Osnoy, mm -hmm. um, uh, John McLaughlin, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of stuff. Which shows up as more chromatic colors in exactly, what you're doing. Exactly, yeah. all the, these chromatic, a lot of chord tone stuff. Man, more than anything else, learning jazz improv in college and learning to like focus on chord tones when I'm writing, not when I'm writing, but when I'm like playing a solo and being able to find those chord tones just in every way and use them to say what I want to say in the melody has informed more of my melodic songwriting than anything else. And people ask me like, how do you write such catchy melodies? And I'm like, you don't understand. I had to do this in class every day for like an hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just writing nonstop melodies off the top of my head. It's melodic. 10 times more complicated than these little five note melody I'm writing now. This is easy mode for me, you know? Yeah, but you're, when you're doing it, it's melodic, but it's also, you can hear the themes being developed as you're doing it across yeah. across the actual whole tune. So you have an, you, you have a, you have a micro and a macro thing that's happening simultaneously. Thanks. Or at least I hear that. I don't know what yeah. you you know, that's it's, how I hear it. That's good. It's not intentional, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I'm flying by the seat of my pants most of the time. But, yeah, but your aesthetics though, is, I guess to boil it down to one word. That's, and yeah, that's the thing I love more than anything else is being able to capture a certain sound. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I did with the Green Hill Funk record was just trying to be Wolfpack as hard as I could. But that's you playing drums on there or are you programming that? No, that, I, that was live playing. Right, yeah. Right, that's that was what, fun. That's probably why, it, well, I shouldn't say that, but it feels great. Yeah. That, that record feels great. That was, I put so much into that record. That took me like six months to make. That was, okay. that was like a long, long project. Um, whereas the songs I'm doing now, it's like a two week turnaround at most. For one song. For one song. Right. Yeah, which I guess adds up, I don't know. But, it's now I'm I'm much more um, I still definitely try to capture an aesthetic like on the the last bendy tune mm -hmm. I was going for like my chemical romance black parade mm -hmm. that kind of thing uh, with that like ragtime piano thing also that's there. also you playing piano at like half speed okay, <laughs> one, hand at time, oh, one hand at a time one hand because I'm listening this no. is not fair no, this guy's no, that was playing like, <laughs> the piss out of the piano no, that was and like one two boom Still boom, awesome boom, though. Boom. Your, but your melodic sense is great. The chord Thanks. choices that you're making are great. And so is that a synth or is that an actual attitude, old timey upright that's, piano? That's a synth. So yeah, okay. I, I use samples wherever possible. Yeah. I, I use sampled bass on most songs. Okay. Um, well, I saw you doing that. Sometimes you use three different things and you're layering them together. Yeah, so that was, that was more of like a hip hop track. Okay. That was like three different basses layered together. Um, but But on like my metal tunes, most of the time you're hearing a sampled bass because okay. it's just always in tune. Yeah. It's always perfect articulation. Yep. yep. And when these songs are like this, this genre of metal that I do is so like it's on the grid. It's mm -hmm. perfect. It's gated to hell. So in between each guitar hit, there's nothing. It's amazing though. That's exactly what I was like, man, this sound, I wonder if you were doing the, it was, so are you, that's, uh, uh, that's not you playing through an amp. That's that's a modeled sound or all amp simulators. Yeah, amp simulators have gotten so good. Drum samples have gotten so good. Yeah, it's it's all you can be. I'm in the box a hundred percent. Okay, and it's it's just so quick to just prototype a song instantly. Yeah, and it sounds 
like a final record. It does. And you just go there, and that's it. It does. So that makes the mastering part of it easier when you get to that process? It does, it does, especially with the drums. The drums are basically pre-mixed, so I'll, I'll do a little bit of adjustment to fit the song itself. The guitars sound great out of the box most of the time, mm -hmm. uh, which is hard because guitars are just, like distorted guitars are just a wall of noise. <laughs> <laughs> they're garbage. Guitar is the worst instrument. I hate it so much. <laughs> they're never they're never in tune. Intonation is a nightmare. A nightmare. Yeah. I auto tune my lead guitars because I have to. You have to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you also are using uh, tremolo systems, right? Are you whammy, some kind of whammy uh, bar on your? So I I have a whammy bar. Most of most of my guitar leads are all recorded with that Carvin, which is a hardtail. Oh, good. Yeah, way easier to to be in tune, yes. especially if you you you're anchoring your hand anywhere near. Yeah. Have you played an Evertune guitar? No. Are you do you are you familiar with it at all? Mm -mm. Do you know the Evertune stuff? Is that the one that automatically tunes itself? So that that was like the Gibson the robot. Gibson, I remember guitar. the Gibson robot. Yeah. Um, I don't see it so anymore, so I'm no. presuming it didn't. <laughs> the Firebird X didn't make it. Do you didn't, remember the Firebird X? No, I know a Firebird, but I don't know the Firebird. So the Firebird X, real quick, was <laughs> this guitar they dropped in like 2012, I think. Okay. 2011, 2012. I saw it at um, I want it was either AES or Summer Nam, mm -hmm. one of those, and I played it i sat down at the gibson booth and they were like here check this out it was like a short scale firebird Ooh. covered in chrome with like digital knobs on it and a usb port instead of an input jack and you'd plug it in to your computer and it had like effects and an amp simulator and stuff built into it cool idea sounded like garbage mm -hmm. sounded like utter trash played like garbage so is it because the materials weren't vibrating? Like it wasn't wood, or was it? Wood? I don't know if it was wood. Actually, I think it was. Okay, but it just sucked. It was just a god awful guitar. Didn't feel good at all. Didn't feel good. Yeah, didn't that's everything. Sound good. Yeah. yeah. What's the point? Right. It was thirty five hundred bucks. Oh, and so they didn't sell them. They ended up destroying them all as like a tax write off. <laughs> There's this video <laughs> of a bunch of Firebird X's lined up on a beach oh. and just like a steamroller rolling oh. over them. And I saw a video of this on Facebook and they were like, this is horrible. These could have been donated to a school or something. And I commented, I was like, you don't understand how bad these guitars were. <laughs> this was the best they thing needed for to be removed involved. from this world. They should never be in a child's hands. God, no. Not to mention the Firebird is a horribly uncomfortable yes. guitar to play. I don't know if you've ever played a Firebird. The uh, body style is weird. Long just long balance. And where the bridge is feels yeah. like it's not not as far back as it needs no. to be. You feel like you're, kind of, it's very weird as being a large instrument, you feel very cramped no. on it. So that sucked, the robot <laughs> guitar, nobody bought that. Um, but Evertune is a system, it's a bridge, okay. that has a system of, I don't know what, magic in it, springs and stuff, that maintains perfect string tension at all times. So you know how when you, if you hit a chord really hard, mm -hmm. it's gonna bow mm -hmm. a little bit, mm -hmm. yeah. doesn't do that, perfect. Bah, dead solid. How does it feel? Have you you've played it? I have not played one, oh, okay. but everyone I know who has played one says it's life changing. Okay, and you probably don't want it on everything if you're playing like a lead with a lot of bends and stuff in it. It's probably going to get you get, you get the reaction is going to be different than yeah. Uh, so it counters what you normally would counter with your own physical exactly. Body. Like, yeah. and I'm used to correcting a Me little too. bit for intonation. Yeah. You yeah. you can hear it, and you're always bending a little bit, like an eighth yeah. of a step, just to correct that. Yeah. But with this, you don't have to do that. It's perfect. I might so, have to try that. Yeah. So I have a multi-scale seven string Evertune Telly coming in, oh. in like a month. I ordered it two years ago. <laughs> That's Damn. how long the turnaround on this one is. Is that from COVID or just because they... No, they just they just do a, a line once a year and it takes two years for them to get it out. It's a super small round. Jericho guitars. Okay. They're super cool. They're oh, so the too. Evertune is a system... That, yeah, Evertune's so like a system, the, and Jericho makes guitars with them in it. There's only a few companies that do production Evertune okay. lines. So you it's like the it Buzz Fighting thing, thing, right? Yeah, like, yeah, it's like the Buzz Fighting thing. Yeah, oh, yeah. Fighting, right? Sorry, Buzz. I always, I don't know. I don't know you. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard me play. I don't play like in tune. Like I'm the, obviously the, not the, using either one of these things. <laughs> I always wanted to try the Babix Bridges. Those oh, really cool. I've heard of that, but I've never tried it. Because the, well, they're from around here. Really? Yeah. Oh. I mean, uh, like Jeff Babix is like in in like Poughkeepsie. No shit. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, because you have a uh, uh, the other guy was in um, 
the headless guitars. The, the Steinberg. Oh, Steinberg. Those yeah. are right out of Newburgh, right? Isn't that where that guy was? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a small. That's wild. And there's a guy who, have you met Woody Pfeiffer yet? No. From Pfeiffer Designs. He makes a bridge. Woody's a brilliant luthier over in Venetia. Cool. Makes it an incredible bridge that you, I don't know how it works. Like, would you say Magic and Springs? Yeah. Also the name Something of like Brad's that. girlfriend from, <laughs> n- from ninth grade. <laughs> but he, it's, <laughs> upgrade. <laughs> it's not a tremolo system that Woody makes. Um, Woody is uh, Brad's 11th grade. <laughs> you think I had this many girls back in high school, dude? <laughs> Where are you getting this? <laughs> uh, but uh, it, again, plays in tune, and but it doesn't have any countering thing. This cool, thing yeah. sounds pretty it's crazy. intricate. And it, it's made for like the metal kind of world where you, you need everything perfectly. When you're doing metal, aligned. you have the fan fret guitar. So I have a couple uh, fan fret guitars. Yeah, yeah. They're yeah. cool. They're real weird to get used to. Yeah. My bass, the, the one I play the most is my bass, my ding wall. Uh, which is a, a fan fret okay five string like it's the like if you're playing metal right now yeah you get a ding wall yeah and that's you, the, is that the head is that a headless one or is that a it's, no so i have a strandberg headless okay that's what that's which is not steinberger and it's very confusing it is i know a lot of metal dudes who play those though yeah it's that's got an unusual yeah. body design. it's a real weird guitar yeah. i love it yeah i am not using it to its potential in any way <laughs> every time every time I see, I have friends who play eight strings and they like just play eight string guitars yeah. and it's like a whole different world. And I'm just like, I, I just really need to hit some low notes sometimes. Mm-hmm. When I need to hit those low notes, I'll grab that guitar and the rest of the time I'm playing my seven. Yeah, I noticed that, that when it's when the, the drop yeah. kind of tuning of some sort, it yeah. sounds like, yeah. But seven, I've gotten to the point, I feel like natural on a seven now. I feel like seven is, is home for okay. me. And when I play a six, I feel weird now except acoustic see that's where anything other than a six and i'm like i still i never got past that very unusual if you if you're at all into like uh like a charlie christian kind of um not charlie christian what's his name god who's yeah charlie christian didn't play no 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 god (laughs) what's his name the seven string he plays bass with his thumb like oh charlie jump. hunter thank you yeah God. yeah, yeah charlie yeah, if you're into that kind of thing like seven it's not the same thing as him because he has like three bass strings and four have you seen him play live guitar? yeah oh he's ridiculous y- absolutely y- terrifying yeah i'm sorry you, how, oh hybrid i don't know what it what he calls it i know he has a specific model i think there's a charlie but he uses fan frets yeah he's a fan he was like yeah. one of the first dudes to do the fan fret thing yeah um, his pocket is crazy is insane though like and i didn't i mean i realized it but when i saw him uh he did the woodstock luthiers thing uh, yeah. and i was doing it the same year so he was on and we sat in the audience and when you hear him play in front of you on an acoustic guitar oh my god i can't it, imagine it the feel like the whole you can everybody just starts moving yes. yeah, and he's, he's hilarious too oh i bet yeah he's just a very into like a he's very a lovable kind of dude that's but good. what a player that's good good god yeah, sorry, I digress. No, it's I I love his music. Yeah, um, just the way he can. I feel like he has two brains going at once. On it's absurd. It's He's nuts. orchestrating from both ends. Yeah. It's like with a, one freaking hand. Yeah, I, uh. yeah, and then his right hand, which doesn't look like anything fancy when you just see it, and then you hear what's yes. coming out, and it's like talking about being a drummer, and uh, but he, it's it's amazing. He's been doing a a whole series of videos on Instagram oh, uh, really? on uh, uh, not Blind Lemon. Is it Blind Lemon? Is it, he just is like, it's, he's been working on this for, I guess, a while now. So every every day, it's either one of these tunes or a tune in the style of that. That's and he's super just, cool. Just amazing. Yeah. That's wild. It is wild. So, yeah, I, I like the extra range of the seven. Yeah, I'll sense. do a lot of like the thumb bass line stuff yep. if I'm playing. Um, and it's actually really fun on jazz gigs. Like to just have that extra little just fire bass the bass player. Yeah, exactly. just to, I, I did a trio once where I was playing bass and guitar at the same time on it. And we had, it was like, trombone guitar and drums it was a weird gig <laughs> <laughs> did but, you work on it before the gig or did you let the heat of the, the oh no it was the heat fire. of the moment okay. kind of thing yeah so right in your style of yeah. just like that's all in. that's all my gigs it's just like get called for the thing I, i'm playing keys on a new year's eve gig up at the uh up at the the colony in woodstock sure and um that's gonna be fun. I get more keyboard gigs than anything else now. Do you really? Because I, I there's there's not a lot of folks who can like program something to match the sound of the record. So this is like an '80s '70s kind of tribute thing. Okay. And I need to match the synth sounds of every '80s track on the thing. And so I got like main stage loaded up, and and I just 
violin synth sounds. So when you hear it, you know what it is? I can get close, get close most yeah, of the time. Yeah. And that's, like I've said, that's my favorite skill more than anything else. It's just like figuring out sounds and remaking them exactly as close as I can. I love it. That stuff makes me want to take a nap. <laughs> uh, it's amazing. I mean, that just shows how your head works, though. And, but it, and it's clear in all the stuff that you're putting out that you nice. have that kind of that you are holding all of those things, that, and that's part of what you do. I, it's amazing, it's remarkable. Thank you, yeah, it's man. fun, I have fun with it. Yeah, yeah, you make it sound very easy. Thanks. Um, yeah, when it comes to sounds, I can't really get, I, I'm like, I don't have the patience, I like like clean tone on bass a lot of the time, and I don't delve super deep into that stuff, but certain things I hear mm -hmm. give me like the most nostalgic feeling, like a lot of Frank Zappa oh, yeah. that his band yes. used. Like there's like specific patches that I hear, and like that's all I can think about um, is like does that is is the video game world as exciting to you as like the pop music world when it comes to the like the actual sounds they're in like vibes they're creating yeah with the overall sound of the record so yeah I mean if anything more so because I, I grew up on the video game music first and foremost the um, I think the amount of limitations they had on them when writing for those systems. I mean, the NES could make three notes and a noise at any given time. Oh, wow. So okay. all those Mario tracks, it's like three-part polyphony. The da, 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 da. It's just these moving chord voicings, all three-part harmony. And then just a noise, just literally white noise in the background going. And that's what they had to work with. Wow. Um, and then the next generation, you had your Genesis, where it could do six sounds. Eight bit. Or was it 16? So that was 16 bit at the time. NES right. would have been 8 bit. Yeah. Um, and and like I said, the Genesis was basically a, a Yamaha DX7. And then later, as you get into like when when they could include actual full rendered audio mm -hmm. on the soundtracks, you notice we're not nostalgic for like the sound of uh, a game from like 2007 or 2008. Uh, There's not a lot of soundtracks that have hung around from that era. Like Halo was the big one. Well, that's what I was just thinking. Is and I know you do the Halo theme and got a lot yeah. of reviews in that. But I was literally just thinking like that's one of the themes I think of for the early 2000s. But even that, like, it's a great, it's a great theme. But you don't think of like the sound as no. much. Like it's not, it's not really about. No, it's the an orchestra. Yeah, it's it's. You think of the monks chanting at the beginning of it because that's a cool sound. And I and I guess that's my. I'm very like big picture sound. Mm -hmm. I am terrible with like details in tone and stuff. Like guitar tones, I, I could care less. <laughs> well, my, as long as I'm in the right ballpark, I cannot like, I, I could not imagine needing more than one distortion pedal because I just can't hear it. I just can't hear the differences when someone says like, oh, this tone is so warm or, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of fuzzy one. And like, I will get like, Again, 80% of the way there and call it a day because that last bit of tweaking isn't going to be the difference between this song hitting it big or not. And I just can't focus on it. And the adjustments in tone you can make with your pick and your and your hands as right. well. That's the other thing. Tones in the hands. Yeah, yeah. Big time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. But I don't know of this halo theme of which you speak with the, what did you say, the monks up front? So, I don't yeah. remember the monks. It's the first thing, oh, oh the, the, yeah, of course. It's yeah. like this crazy Gregorian chant oh, wow. and then this whole orchestra kicks in. It's a it's a good song. I guess I never thought of them as monks, but it's, def it's so epic. It's well, like, it wasn't I, monks, it was literally just, you know, the audio engineers at but, the time. <laughs> but, <laughs> makes sense now that you say that, but when you, when you sing that, that melody, it Everyone like our yeah. age who was playing Xbox yep. like knows that yeah. that sound, but there isn't a lot of like you don't think of like Call of Duty games where it's like no, you the don't. soundtrack created such a cool vibe. It's usually just like right. it just sounds like a movie soundtrack, like, like an orchestra. I was gonna say probably because once it's orchestrated, it there's it's not a niche thing anymore. Right, it, and I, it's not I, a I, unique I never sound. Thought of that, but that makes perfect sense when you I'm, when you were working with you know the the sounds of basically these synthesizers, the NES, the Sega Genesis, mm -hmm. all of them they were a unique instrument that was not being played on the radio. It was not being played in movie soundtracks. It was its own unique timbre that you weren't mm -hmm. getting anywhere else. And so we, it sticks out in your mind. As Have you ever thought about taking a movie that's fully orchestrated and then redoing it with <laughs> the DX7 and like, like taking sounds, Star Wars? That could be wild. <laughs> well, I mean, the movie soundtracks that I am attached to are all like John Carpenter soundtracks. Oh, okay. You know, because yeah, yeah. he was using synthesizers wow. and really exploring 
different stuff. And like Hans Zimmer too, he he does orchestrated stuff, but he also brings in these other sounds, yeah. these samples. Wow. Um, we were just talking, I was just talking on the phone to a friend of mine about The Thing the other day. Yeah. And he was saying that's one of his favorite soundtracks. It's so good. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. That's wild. But like redoing Star Wars with, <laughs> redoing it with That could the, be good. I mean like, and the other question is how much would it translate and how much would get lost in that yeah. translation? That's something I always have to consider in a cover. Will this actually survive the, the, the trip from here to there? Yeah. And, and there's stuff I don't cover because I don't think it'll come out. Wow. Good. And Star Wars is one of those things, like there's like, a, there's the band Galactic Empire, I think, okay. who does like metal versions of Star Wars themes. And, and they dress up and like, it's like, a, oh, what's that band? Cool. Who's the band who wears the crazy costumes? They're like stupid. Guar. Guar. It's like Guar, but with Star Wars costumes. It's that <laughs> really? kind of show. Yeah. And um, I saw Guar. I didn't see Guar once, but I was I was at the chance, uh, like picking up tickets for a show I was playing the next day. Okay. Back when they make used to make you sell all the tickets for your shows, <laughs> yeah. I hated playing there so much. <laughs> uh, and Guar was warming up for a set they had that night, and they played Brandy by um, the Looking Glass. Wow. They were warming up with Brandy. It was the funniest thing I'd ever heard. Of. Wow. I used to be big into punk, never got into Guar, but I appreciate I, hearing about their shows. It sounded like yes. a good time. Yeah, <laughs> it's wild. But um, where was I going with that? Oh, oh, Galactic Empire. Yeah, so yeah. they play Star Wars <clears throat> themes on in metal, and it's like cool. It's yeah, fine. Yeah. Yeah. But I want something that actually elevates it by bringing it to a new. It also would change your audience because your audience. That I mean, too. That too. It's not. It's not an overlap. And I've. I am like more and more hyper aware of how specific my audience's interests are. Yeah. Because I will do something that I thought was going to be absolutely killer and it'll totally flop. And looking back, it had nothing to do with what they were actually interested in. You got to, you got to really, if I could like give any advice to anyone trying to make it in music or in YouTube or any creative art whatsoever. It's to be like ruthless and hyper aware of what people actually care about. Because I was making music for so long that no one cared about. And it... it jazz? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like within the jazz world, there's stuff that's hot right now. You're absolutely. Yeah, and, I'm just being an idiot, but yes. No, but <laughs> and and, and it, it always comes down to the, the balance you're happy with finding of like, what's satisfying to you as an artist yep. and what's going to be commercially viable. And I, uh, I am pretty much happy making any kind of music. Mm -hmm. I've had gigs in every department you can imagine. Um, so I'm very happy to cater to the most commercially sensible thing I can, because I will absolutely have fun with it. I will feel creatively fulfilled with it. Uh, and when I don't like when I was doing the weekly covers, I will move on from it. Yeah. Okay. But, um, but right now I'm really happy with what I'm doing. And, and that's the biggest advice I give to anyone starting YouTube or anything. Just like be aware of what people care about and try to communicate to them that the stuff you're making is stuff they should care about. Yeah. And the only way you're going to know is to keep putting stuff out yes. and see what, because I don't think you could have imagined what your audience would be and what would hit as hard as it no. did. You didn't, you were just doing fun. Yeah. You just got to keep trying things. Yeah. I'm always trying new things, experimenting, like out of every five videos I post, one will be some like random other thing. I don't know if it's going to work. And sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. And that helps influence or, or what's that the word, what you're going to do after that yeah yeah if it picks up i'm like okay i need to start mixing in maybe like 30 or 40 percent more of this kind of stuff that's what the vocal songs were i did one kind of as a test run and it did well it got like five hundred thousand views so i was like okay i can do more of these i can make this jump into that kind of content and and, and just you also understand though i mean you can say what you want about your voice and still working on it you you, you sound like quite a great singer but, but thank you but but uh you also aesthetically know how to put to layer it so that it has i can hear the influences of what you're doing oh yeah but i still hear it as it's not something that you're trying to sound like something else you are you have the you have the engineering or the aesthetic part of it you're able to do not just vocally but where it's panned how you layer it and layered it and all those things come into it so your attention to detail i'll say it again is pretty wild thank you yeah. i yeah i i'm a big 
I'm a big fan of like learning a process and then using that process to make me sound good in that situation. But I don't like, so the, the voice teacher that I follow who, who hooked me up with my current private teacher, he, he does these, Chris Lipe, uh, I don't know if you've seen him, an awesome, awesome YouTuber um, who does like how to sing like, you know, oh, this is guy. The, the white dude with long hair. No, he's bald. Nope, and I don't know who that is. There's another guy. I think that, I know who you're talking about. He, he does the impressions. He's like crazy he good. He sings it. like other people and shows yeah. what they do, but he's also a little snarky, so it's funny yes. when he's talking. Is it the same guy? I can't no, remember I, his name, but... The, maybe. The, yeah, but anyway, yeah, he's hilarious, but... but That's good. No, not trying to be. He's this, just funny. No, yeah. this guy, he's like, he's like, like, if you think I'm like warts and all about <laughs> it, he's like really, like he will go through the process of getting the sound of uh. a singer, but he's he's he makes it super clear this is not how to sound like them. This is how to sing like them, how to use the same tools they're using to get your sound out oh, okay. in that direction. Okay. Just like, you know, you can, you can transcribe a solo, you know, a hundred times from someone. Sure. You're still going to sound like you, just a lot of their flavor yeah. coming through. Yeah. And, uh, and so I try to do that in my production. Um, but Chris Lipe is so funny. You watch his videos. He, he says in every video, he's like, this is going to sound like crap for a second because I'm showing you how to get from here to there. And he will like move his voice through the thing and crack a million times in the process. And it's, it's it's just so fun to watch. And there's an audience that wants to see that. Yeah. I that, didn't know this. That wants the real honest process. Yeah. I didn't know this until I started watching your things that that like the more you laid into this is what it's like. Yeah. Because uh, you don't see that. I mean, growing up, like I the most you would get like a, a behind the scenes part on the DVD sure. of a concert album. Yeah. Maybe if you were lucky, if you were lucky, you know, yeah. and That's there was no no one talking about their process at all. Now, when you're like, as you got deeper into like the video game music subgenre, mm -hmm. were you already as passionate about that music? Like, will you just throw that on, listen to it the same as another genre, or is it tied to video gaming for you? It it depends on the soundtrack. There's like, I'm not going to drop on the Mario soundtrack and just listen to that. Um, but certain. So like the Doom soundtrack, the Doom mm -hmm. 2016 soundtrack. Okay, I'm not familiar. Yeah. It, have you heard it? No, but I played oh. the earlier versions of Doom. Yeah, so the first one, that like classic, I mean, they were all just like Metallica riffs rewritten yeah. for, for MIDI and it was super cool. But the new one, the 2016 one. I'm oh, sorry, gentlemen. It's okay. <laughs> Continue, let me turn that stupid thing off. So Doom 2016, when that came out, um, had just the heaviest metal soundtrack of anything ever. Just literally like nine string guitars tuned down to drop nothing and, and just like electronic elements in there. And it was just the coolest, coolest sound. And that was like my favorite metal album of that year was that soundtrack. Now, do you have... Are there like games that you love to play and you hate the soundtrack and then games you've discovered <laughs> where it's like this is a trash game but the like the, the music really does it for me? Yeah, I'm I'm trying to think. I don't I don't think there's one that I'd feel comfortable saying has a trash soundtrack. But um there's ones that like I don't and it's hard because it's all colored by how much I think they would translate to a metal arrangement because yeah. that's always the the like lens I'm subconsciously thinking about these through. But, uh, like, I mean, the uh, there's one game that I adore more than anything else, and that's Celeste, which is a, it's like an indie platformer, super, like, tight controls, super twitchy. It's like Mario on a, on a razor's edge, you know? Um, and the music is gorgeous and fits the atmosphere perfectly, but I can never translate it to guitar, and for some reason that irks me on a level. Um, now, are you, like, as passionate about the gaming itself as the like are you good at games are, like are you, i am like, not that good at games i i definitely have always played video games yeah. i've never been amazing at them i uh i don't play them much anymore because i just work on music like 24 7. um when i do get to play games and this is so sad I have to be live streaming it basically. That's the only way I have time to play games is if I can make it content, which sucks on a certain level. Probably get bullied and then you <laughs> yeah. you're out of practice on the game. Oh, yeah, I, and, I'm and fully. And the comments are even more accurate. Yes, yes, absolutely. The, com the 
live chat is ruthless with that stuff. Even when you're playing with friends, it's ruthless. Yes. I can't imagine strangers, yes. especially eight-year-olds that are just bonkers it at was, it. Yeah. I did a Pokemon stream last week with a friend of mine. We both we both played Pokemon side by side, and we, we were playing the special rule set where, like, if I catch a Pokemon and he caught a Pokemon, they were, like, linked on some level. So if mine died, his died too. And it was like, That's grim. It was like super hardcore <laughs> level Pokemon. And I was just getting ripped a new one every two seconds by chat because I had no idea what I was doing. I hadn't played since like 97, probably a Pokemon game, but it was fun. Um, yeah, so the gaming, it's, it's funny. Like I think a lot of my feelings on video game music are really tied to like nostalgia in my childhood for sure. And even newer soundtracks that I get into are often really nostalgic soundtracks so like undertale was a really big one um that captured the sound of like the 90s earthbound uh kind of super nintendo game um and that's a soundtrack that that i really connected with but it was a retro kind of thing so i don't know i'm very connected to that 90s era of stuff yeah so then is there like do you like to envision almost like uh, reverse engineering those sounds into the styles you're more into like would you ever think of putting 8-bit stuff into it like blending it into a metal into context, like a metal tune or do you like to kind of keep it separate yeah so well like some of them i have like play with me the yeah. sonic no you I, did i heard that yeah i was like that's from the game yeah there i used the patches from the sega genesis on that it was great and um and it was soloed Right, it's like it's just that that's happening. The like, intro is just a piano from the Genesis. Right, yeah. but somewhere in there, there's like a break moving into a new, and it's just the game effect, like or, or felt that way. Anyway, I don't remember. That might have been in hypnosis. There's okay. a moment where the Game Boy thing happens. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was hypnosis. Sorry. Yeah. But yeah. I no, mean, it's okay. You do. Yeah. There's do a. That. It plays. It plays like a a like generic version of the thing that happens when you get into a Pokemon battle. It's oh. This like chromatic crazy yeah. run. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, yeah, I absolutely will use those for effect and stuff. I, I do kind of feel on a certain level that the 8-bit sound is a little played out. Like it's, everyone's been doing like chiptune covers of stuff for, okay. for years. And so I don't tend to do a ton of that. I do have a YouTube channel where I do just chiptune covers of songs. And I regularly forget that it exists, which my viewers get very mad at me about. <laughs> And it, it sucks because it really does get a lot of views. Like I posted three songs in there last week and they all have like 100,000 views. <laughs> well, you only made, I think on in, uh, another podcast, you were saying you only made that to see if you could, if it would get the same traction as your yes. other channel, right? Yes, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that was an experiment started. I was like, I started this YouTube channel when I was like 16 years old, back in 2006. Longest solo ever? Longest solo ever. I started in 2006, months after YouTube launched as a website. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I, the first video I posted on there blew up to like 2 million views. Wow. And then I just kind of sat on my ass for like 10 years and did nothing with it. You thought you made like, it? Well, I didn't understand <laughs> that it was going to be a thing. You know, it was a, it was a whole new media yeah. forming. It didn't occur to me at 16. I wasn't thinking that far ahead. And, and so I didn't take advantage of it the way a lot of people did and are now like massive celebrities from that era. Um, so that, I kick myself for that very often. But... Um, <laughs> But I, I was wondering a couple years ago, like, did I just grow this on that success of being like the only guitar player on on the platform in 2006? Uh, and so I was like, I'm going to try just make a new channel, totally faceless, no connection to my channel. Um, I'm not going to mention it on my main channel. Mm -hmm. And in a month, it had 10,000 subscribers. So I was like, okay, cool. I can do it again. That's did, good. That's good to know. And then I forgot it exists. <laughs> Why? Well, I was able to capitalize on something that was big yeah. at the time, and uh, well, it was new. It. So the fact that I mean, that I think that stands to support what you're doing even more. That when there's that many, literally billions of things to see, that your channel now has grown as big as it is, and yeah. continues to grow. So even so, when the when there's that many fish in the stream, people are still tuning into what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, it's nice. It's really nice to hear. And you're not even doing it by deceit, where you put like a. A sexy picture on a thumbnail on oh. something like it's still like it's it's like what you're doing is what you what is what you get what I, you yeah, see is I try what to you be get. I try to be honest about it yeah guitarists hate this technique <laughs> that said if you could put that hair metal cover photo that would get you, some that would get some <laughs> some kind of reaction I'm sure 
<laughs> but like the clickbait stuff does work. Like yeah. as long as it's honest clickbait, like I think every title should be um, like as clicky as possible. Like tongue in cheek. Like I think there's a way to, to like acknowledge like yeah. wink wink this is this is clickbait but I'm giving you something. Right, right. It's um Adam Neely does it. Do you, do you watch Adam Neely? Mm-mm. Oh, you should watch Adam Neely. He's okay. a he's a, he's a bass yeah. player who talks about just like bizarre jazz concepts. Oh. He's, you'd love him. He's great. Okay. Um he tells my favorite video of his is the one uh about the gig that just completely fell apart. Did you watch that one where they're doing Can You Feel the Love Tonight? I don't know if I've seen that one. Oh, it's it's such a good story. But basically, he was reacting to this video going around of some like jazz combo playing where the whole band fell apart on stage. <laughs> like the drum set, the cymbals were falling off, the oh, keyboard stand really fell apart. Literally. Like the keyboard stand just collapsed in the middle. Of, like within five seconds, it all happened. It was really? Just viral video in the jazz scene. And so he was telling a story about his worst gig. And it was a wedding band gig where the bridesmaid asked to come sing Can You Feel the Love Tonight from The Lion King. And she starts, she's in the wrong key. She's singing like a fifth off from where the band is playing. (laughs) And there's a key change in the last chorus. And the keyboard player, you know, word is getting around on the stage. Like, if we move to this key, I bet we can meet her in the middle and land it. I think we can do this. So he, um, so they're all communicating but it's not super clear what key they're going to. <laughs> and as as it's leading up, the tension is building on the band. They hit that moment, big final chorus, modulate into four different keys. <laughs> and just hobble to the end. And how'd she do? Uh, great. Did great. they make her sound right? Great. Absolutely <laughs> perfect. Have you seen that video of Harry Connick Jr. where he, he gets the crowd clapping on the right beat? Oh no, no, oh no. My God. It's, oh, I think I, that was like It's just like a 10 second clip. Bit, it's right? so good. He's, it's just him, solo piano gig. Uh, or no, piano and drums. And he, um, he's playing and the audience is clapping on one and three. Sure, sure. as you do. And yeah. he's looking at the drummer just like, I can't believe it. And <laughs> you see them saying something. He adds a bar of five, four and it rotates and the audience is clapping on two and four and the drummer just loses his mind <laughs> laughing. It's such a no, good moment. No, I've never seen that. <laughs> But yeah. as soon as you said, have you seen the Harry Connick clip? I immediately started shaking because I don't, no. I don't, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know much about that's Harry Connick. I mean, that's I fair. know his music yeah, very yeah. well. I just don't, I don't look for videos. Yeah, of that's, Harry fair. On that. that's fair. That's <laughs> fair. Um, what was I saying? Adam Neely, he, um, oh, his his thumbnails are always funny to me because he'll do a really clickbaity title, um, like, like what's the, uh, you know, what's the slowest tempo you can perceive you know i forget what the title was but it was like what's the slowest tempo you can hear and it's this really quick baby title and then the thumbnail is just it's 22 bpm <laughs> just like these anti-quick bait thumbnails it's great is that a real scientific uh, it, it was something like that wow. but yeah he, he goes into the science of it so many cool things i'll have to check them out yeah yeah great like video essay yeah type of thing just going into weird stuff like um like how tempo and pitch are the same thing inextricably linked if you play because pitches are just frequencies and Mm -hmm. intervals are just ratios of those frequencies so like a perfect fifth is what three to two right yeah and so if you play a two against three polyrhythm just like that kind of thing if you record that and speed it up far enough it'll sound a perfect fifth Really? Because that's all that's happening. I did. It's an oscillation of three against two. I had no idea. Yeah, I've seen that video. That's the, yeah. so interesting. Great. All all his videos are just like I don't crazy have to deep stuff like that. I know the name, but I just don't know. Yeah, he, I, he's I, amazing bassist. Amazing bass player, and he's he's doing, in my opinion, the coolest stuff in jazz right now. This like wild fusion of you know odd time signatures, electronic production, mm. that that like cool you know groovy quintuplet swing kind of feel okay where the whole beats just like falling apart every beat okay. I, I love that kind of stuff all right i will have to check it out yeah um yeah his band sun gazer sun gazer like, yes. that that is like in that same vein of like you th- you think it's difficult to do the video production of something but then once you once you set the bar so high yeah. on what you're doing with the audio it's like just to even put the song together, it seems like it has to be. Right, so you could put any, any vision. Nowhere is like that, too. Yeah, oh yeah. God. Do you know Nowhere at all? Lewis Cole? Mm-mm. <sighs> that, so it's like. I know Natalie Cole. <laughs> Close. <laughs> <laughs> Lewis Cole, he's, he's, this, he's the funniest dude. He's just like this super weird, 
uh, bizarre dude, crazy drummer, plays like a drum machine. Really? And produces just the craziest like EDM jazz fusion. Um, and he has this girl singing with him who's, who's amazing too. Uh, that's the band Knower, Wolfpack. It's all the same scene, Knower, Wolfpack. Got you. Uh, which Sun Gazer, yeah, everyone in that. Well, they were all, I felt like I found them all around the same time. They had been plugging away at it for a while and like yeah. had a lot of content, but they were, you know, it feels like when you discover someone, that's when they're blowing it up. Yes. But like I found Wolfpack uh, right around when they released The Beautiful Game and Dean Town, the video for that came out. Yeah. And they, like they were, you know, like blowing up a lot on YouTube and they had a really unique angle and sound and production. Like beyond loving their music, which I loved, did their process and marketing and image have like a hugely how you thought about how you were like packaging your stuff yeah yeah that is i, I mean uh jack the the kind of like creative brain behind wolfpack is such like a ridiculous weird brilliant marketing dude i got into them th through some facebook post that was going around oh, just really? a live clip of their of one of their shows um where he just like it, it, it's him. It's like during a break in a song. And he's like, this This is a jazz school no-no. Joe, I need 16 bars of nonstop 16th notes. <laughs> and then they just drop and the bass player just shreds this crazy solo. Oh, wow. And it was just so much fun. They, then they jump right back into the best groove you've ever heard. Wow. And I was hooked from that. That was like right before Beautiful Game came out, I think. Um, I remember seeing that video too, but. Yeah. Um, and then uh, and then Noah also got me on just like crazy weird videos i got into them through the uh the live session they did in that like bedroom session um what song is i'm trying to think of what song they did in their overtime was the first oh, yes yeah. that song oh my god uh what's that bass player's name uh oh that's uh sam wilkes he's awesome he's crazy. i love his playing on that song he's in scary pockets too oh sure yeah yep you know Bill Wirtz at all? Bill, yeah, his video. Bill he's Wirtz. got. He's another guy like he's, great editing style, yes. like uh, and uh, bizarre songwriting. Truly yeah. weird and just brilliant. Weird sense of humor, but it hits. Like, yes. he's got like he yes. just has a thing down. Um, there's also what, who's that guy who's tight with Adam Neely? Ben Levin. Oh, it? Ben Levin's yeah. so weird. I love him. That's that's what jazz is now. I think it's these these people making this like multimedia weird stuff mm. that's that's hitting it really big. Um, I think I think that's the most successful stuff happening in jazz right now and in independent music in general, I think. And it comes back to you just have to, if you want to really hit it big in music, you have to not only be a musician, unfortunately, anymore. You've got to be a video producer and a, a comedian and a writer uh, and just everything. It's yeah, crazy. That makes sense. Was there... Have, have there been points where you kind of had to like cut yourself off and be like, I'm becoming a jack of all trades. I don't care about this element. Like, do you, do you, how much do you outsource and how much do you have yeah. to kind of pull to rein in your interests in like just diving into new stuff? That is a constant point of contention with myself of, of like, can I, like, I don't have time to be a really good full time animator. I can't. That's a whole discipline of its own. I, and I hired out one lyric video and I didn't like it that much <laughs> and so oh, I've just really? been doing them myself <laughs> since but when when you have the lyrics posting during the clip is what you're saying that was yeah yeah, the, the, video. yeah okay yeah um and I and I do really enjoy that part of the process and it's a lot of it is coming down to like making compromises with myself and saying like I can't do everything I I'm a total control freak about stuff I I need everything done the way I want it to sound the way I want it to look I have such a specific vision in mind for these videos and I have fun like picking up a new skill set. So like for that Bendy video, I just watched days and days of animation tutorials and reference material of like short films from like the 20s and 30s and just really dove into that. I could, I, but I say right from how you, the effect that you put on your voice to sound like a 1930s yes. uh, circus, mm -hmm. whatever that was, I don't know exactly what that, but I, that's what I was amazed by in that video is that you have. The piano sounds like an out of tune upright that you'd yep. find in any saloon from 1895 yeah. through probably now by the same exact piano yes. that hasn't been tuned. Still out of tune. But, but you're like all of the aesthetic things are there, which is wild that you study all those things. And the payoff is not there when you delve into the aspect of it that's not worth going into. Right. Because the, you see that your audience cares about this. So these things that you care about or think you care about might not give you 
We Absolutely. Don't come and back I to did review. not need to spend that time on that video in <laughs> any way. That video did not hit nearly as big as I thought it was going to for the amount of time I put in. The into Bendy it. one? Yeah, no. No, I thought that was going to be at like a million by now. No problem. And it's, it's it should like be. 60, That's the 000. one that floored me the most. Thank you. But it's, it's because I'm thinking about different things probably. I, I don't that's know. That's the thing. And I, I was like, I'm going to make like a, a swing rock kind of tune in my chemical romance thing. But that's not what my audience got into me for. They mm. got into me for this like harder electronic kind of sound. So that's what I'm going back to for the next one. Um, I like the way you married those things, though. The fact that it had the lower metal sounding guitar yeah. parts and the you would go the voice would come in over the piano and it's it's spooky -ish. i mean it's really eerie i've fallen into this like horror niche too it's weird <laughs> it's really weird. Well, like those are it's, popular games now i like, know that's, that's what's that's what's always popular with with kids watching gaming on youtube it's the the youtubers who are like playing a scary game and screaming every two seconds and you did that in the bring her to me one is mm -hmm. that wait which one was it where it starts out with the that, that was another thing about I thought with your video editing it starts out with the actual game bright greens and yellows and, yes. and then it goes like apocalypse it's the same scene but goes dark and yeah. like it's like I don't know what that I it was it was it was dark man it was like really I'm looking at I'm like what kind of games are these I know they're all very scary <laughs> um I, I played that game on stream that morning <clears throat> like leading up to the release of that video and I, I screamed a lot of times live on stream oh it was not Fair enough. I didn't feel great about it. <laughs> um, I know in, in that uh, podcast, that, that marketing podcast you were on, you talk about uh, you stopped doing like the live drum videos mm -hmm. and that saved you hours and hours of time on each video and you were able to like cut down the process a lot. But were you quick to pick up on all the, the computer side of things? Like, like, how, like what? Oh, yeah. Trimming down the workflow time on on something as expansive as doing all these different like parts of each video, like how long did it take you to actually develop a workflow that was like yeah you, where you can do things on a weekly basis? Right, I I am a big like power user of any software I use. I'm always like right into the shortcuts, the keyboard shortcuts, anything I can do to like not even touch my mouse is better. Um, and. And it really, it, it keeps coming back to that 80-20 principle. Like, do I need to learn these these parts of the program? No, totally not. I, I just need to learn, like, how to edit drums, how to throw an EQ on something. Mm -hmm. Cool, that's all I need here. So Ableton? Uh, depending on what I'm doing, either Ableton or Pro Tools. Gotcha. Um, Pro, and Pro Tools, really just because it's what I studied so much in college. Yep. Um, I'd probably be on something like Reaper, more likely now, if I hadn't. Okay. Um, Reaper's, like, incredibly powerful really rock solid, super stable. Um, probably every inch as powerful as Pro Tools is, I just don't know it at all. Okay. Uh, and then Ableton is much more suited to electronic production. So if I'm doing something more electronic focused, it'll be in Ableton. Gotcha. But yeah, I, I, I've always been quick to pick up software. Um, my dad uh, is a graphic designer. He worked at the newspaper growing oh, wow. up. And so I, I like pretty much grew up in the newsroom there. We always had Photoshop and Illustrator on the computer Makes at sense. home. So I was like playing with those from birth, basically. Oh, okay, yeah. And uh, and so I've just I was very computer literate from an early age. I think that See, helped. I, I used to be obsessed with computers when I was little. I could sit on, but I was always like we had Microsoft Paint. So yes. I would just be like dicking around yes. with a, with like you know the spray paint. And that's all it, or like, but I like now I go back to computers and it's so hard for me to sit and look at one program. Like the way yes. I could get lost in a simple program, just tr like playing around with it when I was young. Now it, it takes so much focus just to sit and stare and like break down all the different things I could do with it. That I watch a lot of tutorials too. Yeah. I watch like an hour or two of tutorials every day in, really? in various things, whether it's like voice lessons or Photoshop stuff or marketing, uh, email copywriting. Right now I'm doing a ton of because I'm, I'm trying to launch this course and um, and then mixing and music production. I'm still like, I study every day, everything. Wow. While I'm cooking, while I'm washing dishes, you know, I'm, I'm just, I got the iPad up and just watching stuff. It's very inspiring. I uh, mean, I do a lot of podcasts listening, but it's not for learning. It's just for smart lists. Yeah, smart lists is fun. There's 
there's some so there's some podcasts I listen to with my wife when we're on the way to a gig. Nice. And we've got like a gig, you know, 45 minutes away. We'll throw on Smartless uh, Hypochondriactor is a really good oh one too. It's <laughs> a great name, but I don't know. It's that uh, one. it's Sean from Smartless. Oh, okay. Sean Hayes, yeah, really? Sean Hayes. Oh, and, and oh a, yeah, they've mentioned it. Yes. I didn't put it together. Yeah, it's him and a doctor. Uh, bringing on actors telling their crazy medical stories. It's a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> I got to get that one on. So, so we listen to that in the, in the car rides. But when I'm like, if I'm like going for a run or, you know, cleaning or something, I will throw on a podcast. But it's usually something like um, Unstoppable Recording Machine, the URM podcast. Okay. Is a great music production one where they just interview like metal engineers. Wow. Um, and then Six Figure Creative is a really good one. All right. Uh, just again, bringing on like creatives in every discipline. It was a music podcast at first, and then they branched out into like digital artists and videographers and stuff. And it's just super. Andrew yeah. Sheps, you check out his. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's just. It, it's, I've listened to that one. That would, It's so wild to hear them yeah. all talk. I don't know if you check this one uh, out, but interviews cool people. Is that what that's called? Andrew Sheps talks to cool people. I think people. so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Something like that. So, and it's just, it just keeps me in the right headspace. Like I can listen to the funny podcasts and there's a few that I still like trash taste. Do you listen to them at all? I don't know that uh, one. It's these three anime YouTubers um, from like England and Australia who got hired by this anime company to come move to Japan and start a podcast. Okay. And so it's them just like adjusting to Japanese life and talking <laughs> about random crap. It's, yeah. it's a very, very funny podcast. So I'll listen to that for like fun. But I find if I'm not listening to stuff that's more like creative and, mm -hmm. and inspiring Business-wise, I will fall off mindset-wise. Hmm. Makes sense. Now, were you a uh, you big anime nerd too? I, I mean, not like, a good one. I'm not like <laughs> I'm not a great one, but I like I watched Dragon Ball growing up and Yu-Gi-Oh and Yu Yu Hakusho and and stuff like that. But um, but when it comes to like modern anime, like I I want to sit down and watch Chainsaw Man at some point. Oh, I don't know that one. That's, I've seen it. But I've that's like, like that's like the pictures. big one right now. Like I watched most of Attack on Titan, okay. um, but I'm not like super good about keeping up with anime. No. Yeah, there's plenty of big ones that I never got into. I like in middle school and high school, I used to read a lot and yeah. watch some, and you know, I got through some of the the bigger ones. But like, you know, it's the way like video games had a big influence on my mm -hmm. on what I listened to when I was younger. Um, Definitely some animes like oh, Cowboy yeah. Bebop, yes. especially like that. Great I feel like jazz put, soundtrack. put jazz in that my ear sense. before I was even thinking about that it. That makes you know? a lot of sense. Um, and then later, like same with like Samurai Champloo. Yeah. Like like uh, just animes that have great soundtracks. Not yeah. that I don't love love the style. There is a lot of cool animes that are just amazing stories, but They're that so is long. They're like soap operas. Uh, oh my God. Me. <laughs> Me and my girlfriend have been watching Desperate Housewives. Oh my god! <laughs> and it's it's kind of like Naruto for women. I'd, it's like instead of trying to be the Hokage at the Leaf Village, they're trying to get married. Basically, that's, <laughs> it's like Naruto. <laughs> there and, you go. And it's like it's I get it's cringy and it's beautiful in its own way. It's like yes. it's 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 like they've stylize all of, like the weird tropes to fit into this giant epic structure yeah. where like once you get past the weird like shonen archetypes that right. are always going to show up in all of them and all like the like cheesy stuff that like at first seems like it's a kid show like yes. all of them just after like hundreds of episodes after just a few hundred yeah <laughs> into these like amazing things which is so I can appreciate it, but it's so hard to stick yeah. with it, one of them for all that time. Yeah, the short ones, like One Punch Man is fun. I love I, One I, Punch Man. I watched a few episodes yeah. into that recently. I'm That's not, right. not done yet. But. Like, I, I like that one because it subverts everything about, because you know, so many of these animes are like, you know, big muscle dudes like powering up and then fighting for like 40 episodes and blah, blah, blah. Like Dragon Ball Z was famous for that. They'd okay. like, it'd be like a five minute fight that lasted like 16 episodes. Oh, and it would just be the two of them <laughs> screaming at each other for twenty minutes, and that's the episode. But one that punch sounds man, a lot like Desperate Housewives. Yeah, like what you're saying. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. And and so this this one anime came out, One Punch Man, where this dude who is just so stupidly overpowered that he can kill literally anybody with one punch. Oh. So there's no drama, there's no tension in anything, and the whole thing is just them subverting every anime trope the whole time. It's very funny. Yeah, Gintama is kind of like that, which I never yeah. watched, but just reading it. Like it was, it was just like a play on the tropes. It was mm -hmm. like, it was, I would laugh out loud. Yeah, I love that they're getting self-referential about yeah. things now. Yeah. And then Attack on Titan was just a whole thing of its own. It's 
it's like a political drama. It's like a war film. I didn't get too but, far. Like oh I got like God. a season maybe. And it's it was crazy. like really good, really dark, but also kind of like. It's so dark. Like a little too intense sometimes. That, yeah. Like the first episode, the main character's mother gets her head bitten off by a giant. <laughs> and like the most graphic. <laughs> it's burned into my brain. Yeah. I'm like Desperate Housewives. But the first episode, uh, the main character's mother gets killed by a wedding caterer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Does that happen? No. <laughs> But actually, no surprise. Actually, I, so a botched I, facelift. Or my, something. Yeah. My, my mom watched Desperate Housewives when I was younger, and the first episode there is a surprising death. Is wow. makes it very interesting, and it's better than I would have thought it was. I will say that. That's good. I will say that. I yeah. My wife and I try to watch a lot of shows. There's so many shows that I feel obligated to watch. Mm -hmm. You know, like like from your wife or from society. Society. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, my wife and I are on the same page about being like exhausted at the concept of sitting down to watch all of Breaking Bad mm. or something. Well, now you. Now well, I've seen the first and last. I've episode. heard. <laughs> <laughs> I did listen to all the episodes of the podcast. Later. You oh, did, thank not. you. They're awesome. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> so you're the one. Yes. <laughs> Especially the it's Mike been Clark. Been a busy week. Uh, the Mike Clark one Mike was, Clark so, was so good. Yeah, yeah. There's actually some really funny clips just from. The, I mean, he was yes. he was a lot of fun to. Uh, he was to, a riot. Yeah, I mean, he was. Yeah. I remember, I remember when he came to St. Rose when I was there. Yeah, that was with Laura, Laura Hartman brought him in the first yes. time. Yep, and I remember that was the first time. It was the second time that I had played. I played with him on another gig years prior to that. And Am I then, crazier? Was Malcolm there too? I had I brought Malcolm there. Yeah. Malcolm Cecil. Oh God, yeah, I, I wish. It, it, I'm so sad he passed. He would be such an amazing guest. Oh my God. Here. Yeah, if we could oh. do it. I don't yeah. think I have the hard drive space no. for, the, yeah, for the, no. the amount of story. I mean, he just, what a brilliant, lovely genius of a man. I got to spend my 21st birthday with him. Wow. The day I turned 21, uh, Lloyd was interning with him that summer. Okay. And I, uh, he was like, hey, come, come down and hang out with Malcolm for a day. In Socrates. In Socrates. Yeah. And I drove Malcolm around Socrates and we went to a diner together. I've done that. And I, I'm just sitting there driving <laughs> and thinking, the guy who produced Superstition that. is in my back seat right now. Yeah. I need to drive very safely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he and yeah, he just told incredible stories and showed us around his studio. And my God. The first time I met him, I got hired to play uh, it was a trio gig somewhere, and nice. uh, I think I've, I've met, might have mentioned this before, even on the podcast. And long story short, is we played the gig. He was great, we, but he's a very I mean, he has a big white he yes. had a big white mop of hair yes. and uh, the British accent. His name's Malcolm and yes. Cecil. There's no anyway. I got home. There was around Christmas time, and for Christmas, my sister in law got me the Stevie Wonder box set, and I, nice. I read the came with a big booklet of uh, liner notes. Did you and, not know who he was? No. <laughs> No, no. This is like this is uh, 2002. Oh my god! 2000. I love that he was just playing bass gigs around the Hudson Valley. He was like, playing in a library in Rhinebeck god. at the Rhinebeck Amazing. Library. I mean, he got yeah. screwed so bad. He, uh, you, oh, and, oh, uh, career. I mean, uh, yeah. uh, as far as well, yeah. He had a stunning career, but there yeah. was different things that he came yeah. up against. But with the with Stevie Wonder in the box set, there's at some point Stevie, I don't know his exact words, but he said, I'm reading this, I'm at home, and um, the smell of candy canes in the air, I have a coffee, like it's just, I'm just reading liner notes in my pajamas as I just got it as a gift. And it says, this would not be possible without the genius of Malcolm Cecil. And I read his name, and I'm like, I just played with a Malcolm Cecil. Can't be the same one. <laughs> And you Google him, and there's the hair and Tonto. No, I didn't. I didn't even Google him. I called him. I called him, and, and it was like seriously. Like I'm sitting there, and I'm like, "Hey, man, is this you?" And he's like, "Oh yeah." yeah. In that, in that very like, it, like nonchalant, not very, not, not even purposely like. Oh, now I got him. He's gonna. I'm no. Just, no, no, he would never. He no. just meant. And I'm like, "Are you serious?" And we talked, and I had no idea. So then I was having a problem with the recording at the time. I had done this organ trio mm -hmm. recording, and I was having some issues with just getting it to what I wanted. So I said. I, I figured uh, he must be an engineer, yeah. right? So, so I'm he like, knows his way around a board. He knows, yeah. So I was like, hey, can you help me with this? And he's like, yeah, bring it over. So I go over, and when you walk in, you've been in a studio. As yeah. soon as you walk into the right. It's a barn. It, yeah, it is. It's a beautiful like bar on his property. Yeah. But right to your right, I don't know if you remember this, when you walk in on his ginormous monitors, is a Grammy. 
Yes. So I'm, I'm I, and I, right, you, yes. is it still there? Yeah. So I, I went in and I'm reading it and it says, uh, engineer, Grammy for engineer of the year uh, for uh, fulfilling this first finale. Like, do you know what else that was up against that year? Like, what? Dark Side of the Moon. Oh my God! Like, he won. Yeah. So he. So like. <laughs> so, and it's a paperweight. He wasn't nonchalant about it, but it's sitting there. I'd never seen a Grammy he, before. What I remember that day is um, w- walking around the studio. He showed us around. Oh, he had the big the thing that he built for Stevens Institute with the sound. That he built. It was a very odd. Uh, acoustic thing yes. right like yeah this bizarre acoustic treatment he was and you working sit on. in it and you you're like it's yeah it's like an anechoic <laughs> chamber kind of situation yeah it was crazy yeah but the what what struck me the most he um the the walls of the barn were it, it was almost like as i remember it was like moving blankets basically mm-hmm. just kind of cover and sound walls. like sound walls yeah yeah, yeah. Do you know what was behind those yeah, I do. blankets, those walls? <laughs> it was master tapes to just like every record you've ever heard. Yeah. Just like freaking Stevie Wonder master tapes. Just all from the insulation session. in his yeah. walls. It's basically it's like future presidential library yes. material. So no joke though, there were interviews. With, he did a whole series of interviews with Muhammad Ali oh, wow. that have never seen the light of day. Oh my God. And I don't what? know where. Yeah. And the, was Tonto there? I think Tonto was there at the time, yeah. Do you know what Tonto is? Um, yeah, uh, so uh, Johnny Depp was in, <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 in the reboot of that of the cowboy yeah. movie. Yeah, yeah. It's right very the, well received. Yeah, so right in the back, there's Johnny and Amber Heard. And they're... <laughs> and, 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 and a grumpy. There's a grumpy. Yeah. <laughs> Glad we could tie that all yeah. in. Yeah. Uh, but Tonto is the synthesizer. It's, Tonto stood for total... T- Oh, Tam- I don't remember. Tambral orchestra. I can't remember what it means, but it's the synth that uh, living just enough for the city, super si- everything mm-hmm. from music on my yeah. mind through right up until songs in the key life. Just shy of that. So I think there's four records: yeah. uh, fulfilling this, uh, inner visions, talking book. The all that programming happened on this synthesizer. This giant modular. Nine yeah. towers, oh, God. or three? Yeah. Is it nine or is it? Th- I remember it being a three piece, but like three high, so like nine cabinets yeah. full of just like hand built, one of a kind. He hand built that in the in the late sixties, mm-hmm. early seventies, with one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, which he was all he had to his name at the time, and then he made this record, wow. and Stevie heard the record and went to it was at electric ladyland yeah that's where he had yeah. it set up oh god so that's there so in one day i you know you you start to see all these things that he's yes. remarkably part of not to mention 15 albums with gil scott Heron. they had a yeah. record company together and then uh the Isley Brothers on the walls, on all the soundproofing, were all the gold records. Yeah, that just he sitting had. around, Un- unbelievable. And then when you so when you went there to record something or talk about uh, mix something, he refused to use Pro Tools. So everything was done on Sadie, which I guess is a film editing. Yeah, yes, that's right. I thought it was Pyramix, but no, Sadie, Sadie. you're right. Yes, oh, so God. he refused to use Pro and Pro Tools has this, or they used to have this uh, thing where. Uh, when you export it out of Pro Tools, they renamed it and you couldn't find what it is that to, to tie all the tracks It's gotten together. better about that, thankfully. Right, so he created his own software hack so he could line up all the tracks. So it took a minute to get all of your stuff out of Pro Tools and into Sadie. My God. And then through that, he would talk to you about all these things. And he was an absolutely yeah. amazing human being, total genius, and also played bass. So when he first got to the States, he was, with, with he was in a duo with Jim Hall. Oh my God! Is that, so that's yeah. what he was doing. He was also in the house band at, at Ronnie Scott's, I believe. Right? And before that, he was in the uh, what, the the British one of the orchestras. Mm-hmm. He was mm-hmm. the principal. So like, dude was like super bad on so many levels. Everything. But when he talked about engineering or or the creative process, he just was deep on all all those levels. And he had the original bills that he that for for the Stevie Wonder sessions and when you look at him it's like whatever it was listed it was $10 an hour that was his rate and he worked for $10 an hour in That's 1971 wild. to 75 76 right. something like that. and they put out an album a year and God. then I think the falling out yeah. I mean I hope I'm not talking out of school here it was uh, I don't know much about the he he wasn't getting any points right 
right. which Producer is what you were yeah. referring yeah. to. He wasn't getting any part of that. And he asked for one point and, uh, and didn't get it. Th- and that's when that's when their relationship, mm-hmm. I get, I don't want to say Wild. ended, but, no, but, but they're changed perf- for sure. Changed. Yeah. yeah. Until they got back. Uh, yeah, Stevie asked him to help him on the soundtrack to Jungle Fever. Oh, okay. But when you went to his house, did he did he talk about any of the Stevie stories? No, he didn't. He barely mentioned Stevie. Yeah, he was. He didn't yeah. really seem to talk about it much. He he talked a lot about like um, <laughs> I remember one story of him talking. He was in the RAF, I think. Okay. Yeah, like the Royal Air Force. <laughs> yeah, I, and, I, I, and, that's going. That would have been going back. Yeah, yeah, long like yeah. before he came to to the U.S. <clears throat> obviously. And I, I just remember him telling this one story. I don't remember if it was at the clinic at St. Rose or oh, like over been. lunch, where. Um, I don't know why this is burned into my brain where he was talking about how he got injured one time on an exercise and he ended up in the, the infirmary and his ration every day was just a pint of Guinness. <laughs> that was his food for the day. That's what they gave you. <laughs> so I think of that every time I drink a Guinness. That'll keep you healthy. Yeah. 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 He, he, he was, uh, he was a remarkable, remarkable dude. Yeah. Uh, there was something else. That, it'll come back to me. There was something else I was going to mention about the, Oh, so in uh, living just enough for the city, there's mm-hmm. a vignette, section in there right i don't think they have it in the re- like if you listen to it on spotify they took out this like 60 oh, really? seconds do you know what i'm talking about I know what you're talking about where the, the guy record, yeah. he gets on the bus he's like hey brother take this across yeah. the street and he gets arrested and all. they made that at a diner they, <laughs> they, they he talks about all this so that was a the vignette thing was malcolm with a portable recording and his wow. his other partner was um uh, uh margolif uh, yeah. uh, what was his first name? Ma- I don't was remember. It Mar- I remember it was three guys. It was Stevie and Malcolm and one of the. And Margolif was the man's. And I apologize for not knowing, but the sound of the bus pulling away is actually a, a, tr- a, a, a like either a dump truck or a tractor trailer <laughs> that was parked at this diner, and they recorded all the sounds in the field like that and put it all together. So when you hear. It's kind of like when you see, like, we can't see that no. the way that you can, we can see you the well, whole process doing it, which is fascinating. It's a different era. That and it, it, like, even stories like that show you that so much of every production of every media you, you've you listened to or watched really is just people messing around and having <laughs> fun and, like, doing crazy stuff. You watch the behind the scenes on any of these movies now yeah, and how they make these effects. Like, it's the silliest stuff and it's so much fun. Yeah. So it's... Yeah, it's just doing it. Yeah, there's no, there's no magic. I mean, there is absolutely magic. It's magical that happens at, a, at, yeah. a, at a top like production level. There's dudes who can just do stuff you'd never even think of. But at its core, like there's so many things I've seen the behind the scenes of where I'm like, that's what that is. <laughs> are you kidding? Like visual effects in movies and yeah. stuff are the stupidest things. Sometimes it's so funny. I love it. It's and you learn that this because you're watching different podcasts talking about how what happens. Yeah, yeah. yeah I watch the behind the scenes on them. Uh, Disney's actually been really good about making um, the behind the scenes stuff on all their films that they put out. Mm. There's a really good six part. It's like six hours long. The making of Frozen Two. I've never even seen Frozen 2, but I watched this whole thing and was just enamored with it because they go through every part of the process. I got to start Again, watching like some of these things. Really gritty, like the the writers breaking down because they just cannot figure out where the story's going. Wow. It's it's wild. Amazing. Yeah. Well, I haven't seen Frozen 2. <laughs> Frozen 1 I saw recently. It's better than I thought it would yeah. be. Um, but uh, just, just so you know, we're... About two hours in. If oh, you need yeah. to go at any point. I have no timetable today. Awesome. I'm good to <laughs> go as long or short as y'all want. Well, I'm, I'm uh, having past. a great time. So how about we just make it longest podcast ever? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> no, there we go. No, no, we, we, we can get wrapping up soon. But, I'm, yeah. you know, just to get further outside of what what is like face value when I, when I look you up online, like out of everything we've talked about, like what's the what's the like biggest musical influence that people wouldn't expect? <sighs> At a base on what we talked about, like, yeah. is there something that really like uh, is a big part of your palette that we wouldn't really guess? That please is, say it's me. Please say it's me. Please. Say <laughs> I mean, it. yeah, like I said, like <laughs> yeah. the, the Osnoy and, and Robin Ford stuff that you got me into for sure. Yeah, those dudes kind of huge take effect up a lot on, of my, on my guitar well. playing, and um, and similarly, like also Will Lee's playing on on. All that on Oz's stuff. record, yeah, yeah. yeah. got got um, me thinking about bass in a certain way. I'm pretty angry that I didn't know that. Like, I, I looked up your your like name on music, Apple Music, and that album didn't yes. come up. And I'm like, I didn't get to find out about this before the interview. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a good record. I'm too. very excited to listen. Yeah, 
so much fun stuff in that. There was there was one moment, and I'll, this is so stupid. I'll always cherish it though. We were playing this one tune that had this crazy unison line in the middle. It was like the Spain break, you know, the, that, yeah, that, yeah. That, that that kind of thing. Uh, syncopated, crazy, chromatic nonsense, and we tracked it live, and then we were listening back to it. And there were some like there were some flubs in there, so yeah. I was like, "All right, let's all go back in one at a time." Overdub, sax player goes in, does his part. You know, Chris Hemenizer. Sure. Yeah, he was amazing. He was the sax player on that. Yeah, he's a great. He's also does he teach? He, yeah, he's a teacher. Yeah, he, he was a teacher at the company I worked for for the last like ten years. So that's how I know him. You know what? That's why I know about this record. Oh, there you because go. Because he was. We talk. I was like, "Why do I know part of this story?" Yes. And that, that yeah, Chris, he plays in the. He used to anyway in that reeling in the years thing that I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Monster that, player. The, the second he touches the sax, you can just hear like live from New York. It's Saturday yeah, every time. Yeah, yeah. He's every all time. in. Really amazing player. And uh, so he he went and redid his part. Uh, Barry went and redid his line. Will went and redid his line. And and they come back and they're like something's still not right. You gotta you gotta go do redo yours. And I'm listening to it. I'm like, I really don't think I screwed up the line. Can we solo it? I'm like, no, it's fine. Can we solo? And then we solo Will, and he screwed it up again. <laughs> <laughs> little little satisfaction. I love Will. It was yeah. just like I didn't mess it up. And he did. And that's kind of cool him. to me. It was him, the guy that's been on over a thousand yes. recordings. It was him. He was such a riot. He was amazing. I met him when I was. Uh, he did a master class when I was like eighteen at SUNY Purchase. Nice. And uh, he sang. We had no idea yes. he, he, that how many commercials were like. Oh, that's Maxwell House. Like, I remember you telling me. He yeah, the, the, it's like insane. Yeah. Like how many jingles that that man has done that's on crazy. on uh, just his voice alone. Yeah. Amazing. What a pocket. My goodness. But uh, but as far as influences go, I mean, it really. And I hate 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 when people say this, but like, I so listen to everything. I really try to take something from everything. I lived in Nashville for like half a year, mm -hmm. and and I you know, was in the studios there picking up a lot of country licks and stuff. And to this day, anytime I'm soloing on acoustic, I'm pulling from that kind of stuff that mm -hmm. like major pentatonic flat picking down here kind of thing. Uh, I mean, horn arrangements that I write are all from the ska music I was into in college. Um, jazz stuff is obviously like permeated everything I do, especially lead guitar playing and melody writing. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to think of like the weird unexpected thing you wouldn't think of. I mean, I, I wouldn't have necessarily expected ska. That was like, yeah. back in high school, I was a big ska punk guy. Like, I mean, what, what's what's your favorite, like, what's your favorite so ska I'm like, music, but also your perception of ska as a genre? Yeah, I, I'm a very, I'm not a, um, I'm not like a deep cut kind of guy. I'm a very base level fan of most genres. Uh, so like, as far as ska goes, it's like Real Big Fish and Streetlight Manifesto, mm -hmm. Catch-22. Um, and that's about as deep as it goes, but I'm super into Real Big Fish and Streetlight. I've seen Streetlight like four times now. Um, you didn't happen to see them when they played Rose Rock. I didn't. That's the one I missed. I swear <laughs> to God. That was like one of my first, like I, when I was so into punk, I had like a much taller mohawk. Nice. I would spike it up every once in a while. And my older brother had like a foot tall mohawk that he would spike up a lot. He did? Not Tom. Oh, okay. My brother Dave. <laughs> And like, I can't picture that for a second. <laughs> no, me either. Like, I was thinking the same thing. I was like, wait a minute. I remember. No, no, no. My brother Dave and I, one of my nice. like, first shows ever was um, when I was like, it was like early high school for me. We went to Rose Rock when Streetlight Manifesto nice. was playing. And I was just in the pit like the whole hour. That's awesome. No, I, I always had a gig on Rose Rock. Unfortunately, oh. I always had oh, something else going on. <laughs> better, better to have um, a gig than yeah. being be a mosh pit yeah. for your career. I remember I'm a real big fish just from basketball. Yeah, so that oh, was I that never was saw that's oh, where they got their start. Yeah, <laughs> really? Yeah, that's their take on me comes in there. Yeah, that movie's great. <laughs> yeah, they great. hated them. The, those boys hated uh, you know Matt and uh, Trey. Trey and Matt. They yeah. do not like, but I mean it's one oh. of my favorite movies. Of it's all a good time. one. Yeah, it's, it's a, good a good one. one. Sorry, I digress. No, it's okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I don't know. It's like literally, I try to take something from everything. I really try to keep up on what's going on now. So like this week, I'm writing a track in this genre called funk, funk P H O N K. Which is like, it's this this genre of mostly instrumental hip hop that draws from like the '90s Memphis hip hop scene. It's all like these really lo-fi, broken sounding samples. Hmm. Like the whole thing just sounds like it's on the edge of falling apart. Okay. And it's it's a really cool genre, and it's picking up now again. So I figured I'd, I'd try to write a style, a, a track in the style of it this week. I 
fucking fun. So it's an original track that you're doing, or is it a cover? It's it's, it's an ori- it's the one you watched the stream of the Bendy, the new new one I was writing. Gotcha. So that's, so that's, so that's that the one where you're using. Like that's the tripled bass. Yeah, thing. the three basses yeah, yeah, layered. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And are you really doing? Are you using some guitar synth sounds on that, or are you? So it's uh, it's like three different bass sounds. One is just like a sub bass, just like blowing along the, the yeah. undercurrent. I, I didn't even hear it in the track, and then you solo. And I'm like, oh, yeah. That's what you're. That's yeah. what's there, which was wild to see you break it down like that. Yeah, I, I love how those pieces fit together. I don't yeah. know. It's it's really everything. I try to pull a little something from absolutely everything. Hmm. Um, another question I had was you you know your first video went viral mm-hmm. in the early days of YouTube, and you've, you like you you already have your guitar playing showcased to like over a million people on YouTube. So going forward, going into college, becoming a professional musician, did that like affect your mindset in, in like any weird ways? Like were you like it was it was really, it just like no big deal or w- was there like a little bit of a like i had a you, like it was a pressure almost on you i had an ego in college i definitely had an ego and um especially like freshman year when i first got in there i, was like, I wasn't I'm there the i didn't i didn't Guita- know freshman guitarist at college yes, you, you kind of have to it's have a it. unique breed <laughs> for sure and then um and then lloyd who who became like my best friend best friend throughout college like knocked me down a peg <laughs> Did he really? Oh yeah, that's that's how we became friends. Was he just hated me, and <laughs> and he yeah yeah he called me Star Boy all the time, and that, that was like his. I, Lloyd. I haven't spoken to since then, but he, he was always um, yeah. hilarious and a he lot is. of fun to be around. A little wild, you know, yes. I always liked. I mean, he worked on the him and Jared were the did the, the when I did the record up there. Those guys, oh, really? Were, nice. Yeah, I have pictures cool, cool. of Lloyd. Me, Jared, uh, Sean Wendell, Mike Nappy, Dave Lavolsi, and Malcolm. Nice. Oh, yeah, man, we, nice. We were all like kind of hanging. So yeah, that was a fun. That's awesome. Fun group. Yeah, you were part a of a really fun group. It, it was a good. It was a good few classes. Right? Yeah, good times. Yeah. But um, yeah. So he he knocked me down a peg, <laughs> and but but as far as like um, like the YouTube, thing, it's funny. I it never. It still doesn't feel real in it because I never see this many people i'm not playing to an audience of like 2000 people mhm uh, i did once that was fun 2000 people is a nice with song. the 80s band we played this festival outside 2000 it was a nice feeling there's nothing on earth like the feeling of playing the first two notes of sweet child of mine and hearing an audience lose their goddamn mind it's that's a very singular feeling and don't you you might be doing this again you you might you, you, like i like i play in that steely dan thing People lose their mind yes. for that that band in a way that I've played. The most people I've ever played for had nothing to do with the music that I've actually created at yeah, all. Yeah, same, same. Yeah, <laughs> but you start out, uh, Josie, you play the first couple notes and yes. the same thing happens. They're there. And it's yep. wild. It's, it's wild. Great. It's so a great feeling. As you get older, to it. Yeah. yeah. As you get older, you're going to be playing. You might be playing for that generation, you know? Yeah. You might be breaking out the wigs again. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> it's possible. And I would love to play some live shows. I just started talking about playing some live shows as longest solo ever. Like there's. Oh, wow. There's, uh, there's like, you know, conventions and festivals and stuff that are gaming focused. And, uh, and people do play at them. So, like, I could. Put together a little one-off band and, and go do one of these sometime. I'd love to do that. Yeah. I, um, when I first heard, or like when I first saw the longest solo ever title, like what I, came to mind, there's so much content. Like I don't know, I can't sort through all the videos you've done. Yeah, no. But what I pictured was like record-breaking live stream where you just keep going. Like, have you done anything like that? No, it's a stupid name I picked when I was 16 and I'm stuck with it. <laughs> I like, I, uh, I think it's a great name, but that's what it makes me memorable. For. Yeah, and what's funny is, um, you, you mentioned that marketing podcast that I was yeah, on. Yeah. One of the things I probably mentioned in there was I realized I was looking at my retention graphs and every song I would uh, I would pad out the arrangement and like write an original solo for it, some crazy shred thing. And I would look at my retention graphs and it would drop right at the guitar <laughs> solo. It's like, why am I spending so much time on this? Get rid of the solos. Yeah. So I don't really solo much in my songs anymore, which is ironic. That, that is, is hilarious. But, uh, the record for the longest guitar solo ever is like 48 hours or something. Jesus. And, and you had beef with that guy? I wouldn't. I just, <laughs> I'm going to leave him alone. I could Which never. Which album was this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it was just some dude in Texas at a bar, just like nonstop. For, for two, two days? days? Yeah. <laughs> oh, nope, my I won't go God. near it. One BPM. <laughs> no interest. Yeah, yeah. No, no interest in that. 
And no offense for all you Ingve lovers out there. I am simply just making a stupid yes. joke. The dude's an astounding guitarist. Yes, he had incredible <laughs> technique. I've never heard. It was Ingve Malmsteen. Ingve Malmsteen. I don't. Yeah. I don't know any of his music. <laughs> well, but I hear, well let me ask you this: What other Ingve would it be? <laughs> Do you know a lot of Ingve Johnson? I know several Ingves. Which one are you? <laughs> what is this to which you refer? He's, he's just like. Neoclassical, a million notes per second. Amazing picking technique. One Unreal. of the greatest uh, alternate pickers yeah. you will ever. Arpeggio, sweep arpeggio, perfect, flawless playing. Like closest since like Jason Becker, I'd say, easily. Yeah, Jason Becker, probably a, a better blues bluesier side yeah. of things yeah, you know? yeah and even though that's very subjective but yeah it's funny Yngwie tries to be bluesy and it's very funny to me <laughs> there's a video of um one so one of the like first formative guitar moments for me was when a friend of mine sat me down and made me watch uh g3 oh god yeah satriani so vi, satriani yep. yeah and, satriani vi and Yngwie was the first one i watched and they close with voodoo child i, I know exactly and what it's Yngwie about. playing <laughs> like neoclassical like yeah. over voodoo child yeah. it's just the weirdest thing <laughs> yeah yeah he also played uh spanish castle magic on, yes. a, on a live record uh and because i had all this stuff when i was a kid. oh yeah yeah but i he before there was chat rooms and hate mongers on youtube the early comments just were people listening to stuff and talking about it. and he he uh li i would read a uh, uh, guitar player or circus mm -hmm. these were two magazines when i was a kid and uh, he talked shit about Stevie Ray being a <gasps> being a sloppy player, and the whole world with that was just like, wait, what? <laughs> what are you talking oh about? God, yeah, yeah. So it was really funny oh because God. when he came out, there wasn't a lot of folks. I mean, he kind of, that's he was at the forefront of that genre. Yeah, yeah. But uh, to say he, I think he said Stevie Ray sounded sloppy. Oh like, was like, this before Stevie Ray passed? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Because Stevie died August in 1990, and this would have been right. like 1986, yeah. 87. Wow. Still. Lots of leather pants and dragons oh, on yeah. album covers and that kind of stuff. And he's still rocking that exact look. It looks, yeah. Uh, actually, he's an example of some. at some point you get a little too old for leather pants yeah. and he's crossed it yeah he's cr no offense but i i guess some offense but some but offense. but um when you have a, when you're a little puffy and your gold rolex is really shiny and your shirt's unbuttoned down to what used to be your navel and i have no ground to stand on here but i don't wear leather pants anymore oh, well, never have never Same. have you could get away with it you put that wig back on maybe. and you can pull it off maybe did you buy leather pants for this show or was it all spandex? no they wanted me to i i bought jeans and <laughs> like ripped jeans instead okay they wanted me to wear like spandex leggings i was like did. that's not happening with like a black le <laughs> black a leggings and then a, a red shoelace yeah. to, to tie it all together yeah. <laughs> over the uh, the cod yeah, no, piece no 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 so uh but yeah that g3 stuff was like Sat getting getting into satriani and vi was my first big like guitar mm -hmm. experience and then getting into oz and robin was like my second yeah Satch being a great drummer as well. Really? As, I didn't know that. Oh, that's him on Satch Boogie. That's him playing drums. I thought it was uh, I thought it was the Bissonette Brothers on that. No, not that tune. Okay. It could. I didn't. Yeah, it could be. It, Greg, I didn't know Greg Bissonette had a brother. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah. Um, Mark? His brother's a bass player. I didn't know they that. They were the rhythm section. Usually it was Stu Ham in that era. Stu Ham too, yeah. Yeah. Stu but Ham, it, Jeff Campitelli was his drummer for a while. After just that, that one tune, I be, I'm yeah. pretty no, I'm sure I believe it was. It. Yeah. It was I mean, his rhythm's so solid. That's yeah. Great player. Yeah, so yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, monster, uh, monster player. I don't know if there was, were we on to an answer to a question and we got sidetracked by Leather Pants? Um, no. Okay. I just was, keep. I, also, I can keep going back to you. You saying he was a great alternate picker, <laughs> and I think alternate pickers sounds like a gay antiquing show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's very good. Yeah. Yeah. That's I, always on my brain. No, I that's could. perfect. I love it. I am a garbage alternate picker. My right hand is. is Mine is. Yeah. I. I'm. It's an art. Yeah, I, I learned really solid legato really early on, mm -hmm. like learning Satriani tunes, yeah. and I just kind of leaned on that forever. <laughs> it's true. It, like I, I can totally relate to that because my legato, but my left hand does way more work than my right hand. Same. Different Same. than how you think about eighth grade, <laughs> but uh, I get it. 
you know it, it's uh but the leather pants i'm also thinking if you want to add i don't know what you do on your only fans page but if you're, <laughs> if you're going with your leather pants thing there might be a market there might <laughs> there has might. a much better revenue split too yeah yeah has the best revenue split of any any uh online platform does like, it really youtube is like 30 percent of your income or 40 okay. 30 or 40 uh twitch is 50 percent, which is horrible okay patreon's like eight percent and only fans is two which is wow. real low wow it's wow. crazy <laughs> yeah we don't need a longest fans ever hey <laughs> <laughs> i did um so i've taken a couple sponsors uh and the first sponsor i took was <laughs> where's this going, where is this going? <laughs> the first sponsor i took was manscaped <laughs> And um, and the code they gave me to use for it was longest. <laughs> was like, I did the code longest. <laughs> Come on. Did, so I, I, have you followed your numbers from there? Is it, do you get a lot of people? Um, I, I mean, I got paid from it, which okay. was good. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, because earlier you were saying we were saying it was eight-year-olds, but that would imply that there's closer well, to 14 and 16-year-olds. Well, they, they apparently got no sales from it, and I have not worked with them again. <laughs> oh. But I got paid up front, so it's okay. Well, Okay. Very I mean, nice. you could start doing your stream shirtless exactly. for OnlyFans. And, no, uh, no, it's not the audience. <laughs> no, okay. I don't know. I'm just trying to help. Marketing, yeah. you know. Yes. yes. <laughs> I'm trying to help. Yeah, I mean, long, I guess, for something that... Yeah, there's connotation. It's kind of, an, it's kind of an, like an ironic uh, code to have. It's the <laughs> yes. opposite of what they long, want. Right. I mean, same sure. with us. If, if they were our sponsor, it would be like mink would be the code. And I don't think you want it looking like a mink after you buy Manscaped. I don't think... <laughs> God, yeah, like a monk. You want more like a monk, <laughs> actually, yeah. like a monk. So we might have something here. Just a circle cut. Out. There you go. Let's see where this Dear goes. God. <laughs> so anyway, anyway, guitars. So Manscape. Manscape. Yeah, sponsor us. Indeed. Do you have any other questions? Because we've held this man here a yeah, long time. It's, yeah. No. It's. I mean, this has been great. It's great. Absolutely. To meet you. Loved it. I've been following your stuff. I've Likewise. Been, I've, I, it's, it I feel was like a we should. We might have to do a follow up at some point. Yeah. Is yeah. what I'm. Oh talking. yeah. I'm happy to come back anytime. Would love love talking about this too. stuff. But I like. I saw the the Green Hill Funk stuff a while ago, and like it was in the back of my head. And then yeah. when I like saw it again, I was like, wait, that's how I know. That's how I know about Dean. Yeah. So that was fun. I love that record. It's an honor to meet you because you are. One of the hardest working guitarists on YouTube right now, it, it would seem, and it's very impressive and inspiring. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being had. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll leave it at that. But I think I, I know I wrote down a bunch of questions. Do you have them written down somewhere? <laughs> yeah, somewhere. Where are That's they? That's what I was just looking for, and I was like, <laughs> did I get to everything? But I really, I wanted to talk about, like, I, well, you did it. Uh, you brought it up where you talked to advice to younger people. I wanted to do that, and but you brought it up. I don't remember what, exactly what I had on that. I just said talking about people who are trying to find themselves, but yeah. we got to that. So. It's, it really is. So the advice I always give, uh, I find myself giving advice on YouTube stuff a lot because mm -hmm. I talk to my viewers about that stuff because they're all interested in, in, you know, that's the, the dream for a lot of these kids is to be a YouTuber, or be yeah. a TikTok content creator, anything. Um, and that's that's like one in one with being a musician for a lot of these people. It's the same thing. Um, and the thing I always say is find the overlap of what you love to do, what you're really good at, and what people actually want to like hear or watch. Find the and if you can check all three of those boxes, you win. You're guaranteed. Yeah. And it um, starts with the first two. And then figuring out if you, the, the the audience is there, and right. then if not, and if you're again. not really good at something yet, then go get really good at something by just obsessively doing that thing every day. Yeah, put the put in the time. Yeah, that's yeah. all it is. Yeah, and don't be afraid to suck because it's gonna suck for a long time. You will be bad at things for most of the time you do them, and the more you learn about them, the more you realize how much you suck too. Yeah, like the deeper I get into mixing, the more I can't even listen to something I did last week. Oh, is it really? Is it? Oh yeah. Okay. But yet you still come back and you do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Every time because I'm getting better every time. That's yeah. It. Yeah. I think at least. Yeah. No, you you are. And your 280,000 plus subscribers are definitely support that idea that you are getting better at it. Mm -hmm. So I look forward to what else you're putting out and Thank growing you. the channel. And uh, yeah. Thanks for coming. Thanks for talking. It Thank was you. really cool to go down memory lane a little bit. Yes. And um, make sure you subscribe to Longest Solo Ever on YouTube. Subscribe to our channel while you're at it. Um, we could use the subscribers more. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, but yeah, like the video, comment, follow us on Instagram and Facebook, and uh, 
What were the names of those two albums again? Because I, I want to check those out. Yeah, so check out Posterity and uh, Funk Street, both by Lou Veruzzo. And check uh, out my album Posterity. Posterity. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's good. That's very good. Uh, um, it's yeah. been a pleasure, Dean. Thank yeah, you. it's Likewise. been amazing. And check out my mine is called Longest Fat Mink Ever. <laughs> if you want to check that one out, um, different. Yes. But it's uh, our collab album. It's a collab album. But uh, seriously, thanks for coming. Thank you. It was yeah. great to hang out and uh, see you on the next one. Yeah, absolutely. On that note, one, two, three. <laughs> Thank you.